So welcome everyone who is already joining us uh, in this evening. So in this evening, I mean the, the session, the encounter episode two, we're going to have two special guests here. Uh, one is from Milan, Yuri Asepi, and the second one is uh, Matthew Spring and Johan Hipsman from London. So uh, I'll just briefly uh, maybe explaining about the event. So the event basically is part of the activities that is organized by Critical Context. Critical Context is an annual workshop in Indonesia that every year we, we, we do uh, exercise experimentation in design studio teaching in which every participant throughout Indonesia could join and participating and then we discuss. So this event is actually part of the activities that is organized, uh, organized by that platform. So Critical Context is a platform. And, uh, and uh, this event, the uh, Design Studio Encounter, is the first time, this is the first, uh, this first event that we, I mean, about this, about sharing, uh, Design Studio sharing that we do. So the aim of this sharing is basically just want to know or to get more exposure about how, you know, this unit master, this studio structure, lecture, every, everywhere, conduct their studio in terms of pedagogy, how to organize, what kind of challenge they, they encounter in, you know, in, re, in running the studio, the brief, the complexity, and so on and so forth. So for tonight, we will have two, I mean, well, it's the two guests, but three persons, two guests from two different places that will join us sharing their experience teaching this studio. Oh, well, okay, I will just briefly uh, reading their uh, background is just to give uh, everyone here a context about who they are. The first one who is going to present first, uh, Matthew Springett and Joel Hisman. Matthew uh, is a Riba Charter Architects and, uh, and also uh, an accredited uh, RIB Education Client Advisor. is dedicated to bringing excellence to the design, school of, uh, design of schools. He runs design unit U, UG12 at the Bartlett School of Architecture with uh, Johan Hipsman. Uh, uh, Johan is one of the founder of Art Monger, an award-winning London-based architectural studio. So, and the second presenter, uh, Julia Setti, is an architect with a PhD in architecture and urban design. Her research focuses on urban regeneration and transformation of industrial tissues and buildings. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, so tonight Julia will share her experience teaching also in CPT in India, right? And also in Milan. So it's going to be, well, I'm looking forward for it because it's going to be very interesting. So I think that will be all for the introduction. Uh, so the time is yours, uh, Matt and John. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. And try and share a screen. See if it works. Um, let me see. Is that working? Yep, yep, works well. Very good. Well, thanks very much for inviting us. Um, as you said in your description, I don't, I don't know where you got the images from from the poster. <laughs> That's incredible. I look very <laughs> angry with a sort of cup in my hand, which is uh, which I see. Yeah, I don't remember that. I think someone took that picture. And I look very cold. You look very cold on you, but it looks a bit like Matt's scarf is dripping into my cup, um, which is probably why I'm angry. But it's good. We're, we're happy to be here. Um, as you sort of mentioned, um, Matt and I are primarily architects. I guess we sort of we run our own businesses. Matt runs something called MSA, which we've been running for, for quite a few years. Um, and then also a uh, social enterprise called Matt and Fiona, which is a sort of more recent project of yours, and I, I run a practice called Atmongus Architects, um, which is so. So teaching for us is this kind of incredible, uh, I guess, bridging between the the intellectual value and seeing seeing young students as as a sort of almost like a it's a sort of a side thing to our practices, but it is very very lovely. We've been teaching at the Bartlett for. Well, you're a little, you little bit longer than me for many years, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've I've been teaching for the past um, twenty years um, <laughs> in some form or another at the at the Bartlett and um, and Johan for what ten or so? It's Twelve, something. Yeah, ten or twelve. I've been there for a while. But we've been teaching together um, collaboratively, running a unit, which exactly as Johan says, an extension in many respects of our kind of preoccupations outside work, but at, um, our professional practice. 
Um, and again, just a little bit more slides about the background of what we do. So I think we're both involved in, in projects where we, uh, this is some of, some of my architectural practices work um, at, a, at a fairly small scale operating an, an, an architecture, but the way we try and explore kind of, I guess, hopefully fairly innovative ideas. But, but that's, it's, I guess, in, I guess it's in some of our teaching that we uh, find the opportunity to kind of flex our, some of our intellectual muscles where we we see our practice of teaching as, as a very much a giving and a sharing exercise, but it's also where we, we get a lot of stimulation. And I think in both of our practices outside um, our more conventional architecture, so architecture is building design, we each individually uh, explore other forms of sort of space making. Um, and I do that through sort of architectural installations, often in the landscape, um, again, working collaboratively through a social enterprise where I do work with, with young people. Um, and yeah, my, our practice is sort of mainly London based at the moment. So lots of, um, lots of work it, it, with risk, both residential and commercial projects. Quite weird enough, we've been sort of shoehorned slightly into this um, um, reworking of, of the sort of modernist um, fabric in London. So quite a lot of the lot, I guess the listed 60s stuff, uh, you know, Trillic Tower and Barbican and all these kind of things is, is something we've been involved with. So our, our specialty is, is sort of modern buildings from the 60s and up, I guess. And, and, I, and like Matt, we, we, I mean, we're not quite as engaged in, in installations and stuff as you are, but whenever we can, we try and do a, a nice drawing or, a, or, or like a fun model uh, to sort of just help the practice think about space in a different way, as if you were students again, um, which we wish we were sometimes, I guess. Um, and I, I guess that's in some respects um, that places the context within which we see our teaching. Um, uh, we, uh, we, I don't think it's a curious way. We don't really ever see ourselves as sort of academics, really. We go in once a week and have a really fun, engaged conversation with a group of inspired, you know, uh, young, um, growing and learning architects or, or young people that want to learn about architecture. And that's been the basis of this working relationship that we have together. And it's born, I guess, as much out of rather than a sort of, although that, that's emerging and it has emerged, an architectural sort of philosophy towards kind of program or teaching practice, but actually about a culture of the studio that we that we that we want to develop and want to nurture. So particularly within the context of the school where we currently teach at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL, um, there is a, there is a sort of a culture, I guess, which is often places the tutor uh, and the teacher in the center of the unit identity and that's not not we, we set ourselves separate to that and we're much more interested in this idea of um the obsessions and the preoccupations of a of a student to to engage within to within uh, uh a collegiate environment where they where a group of uh young practitioners um, form uh, an extended family, if you like, for a year within which they are able to um, develop their own identities as young as what young designers um, and build a confidence where they are encouraged to be independent thinkers. Again, certainly within the context of a lot of uh, London school education. Again, the ego and the sort of centre of teaching is with with uh, with the professors or with the unit masters, um, and there's often a sort of a sense of authority there where students feel obliged to seek reassurance for their for their for their developing of their ideas and we, we go about that the other way we we encourage um a strong a strong collegiate relationship between students um that enables them to become hopefully really strong independent thinkers and um here's three slides of the first three years uh, of our of our unit teaching at the at the Bartlett, the show that the, the school puts on at the end of each year is a showcase of, of student work, which uh, historically has had a, pre, um, a predilection towards um, models and, and making as a sort of strong driving force to the sort of processes of, of design, um, but not exclusively to that. Um, 18, you, the year 18 there, you see there wasn't any models at all, and the unit felt quite strongly that they were wanted to develop uh, their, their, their thinking and their exploration of their ideas through through the drawn form and particularly through the kind of conventional architectural drawings. And so the we, we always say to, to our both our students and when we talk about what we do is that if we have produced a sort of identifiable 
selection of work at the end of the year that looks the same or has a unit style, then we've not done our job correctly. So it's about that plurality and about, um, it's about collegiate working but, and, and support for one another and an environment where students feel comfortable, but it's about them being individual strong designers and, and finding the appropriate means to explore and express their ideas. Yeah, I guess in, actually that as, a, as an example is, that, you know, the, um, to be honest, on the 17 and the 19 years that there are some walls with drawings as well, but the, the 18 year, none of the students really were that interested in making models, so we just didn't. We were like, okay, fine then, then we don't make any models this year. And it was nice. It was kind of a, it was really interesting. We always, I guess Matt and I always say to our students to begin with that we, we, we see ourselves as curators of their projects and not as the authors. So we definitely, definitely don't want students to feel like they have to sign off work with us. I think that, that's, that's the wrong idea, isn't it? Show us too much and then we'll try and kind of somehow curate it in something that makes maybe a little bit more sense, right? Um, so we have no, we, I guess our briefs, um, I don't know, I can't remember the next slide, I'm going to see. Yes, that, that, that's, that's the actual physical context. It hasn't been like that for a couple of years, obviously, because of COVID, but um, now it's, it's, students are coming back into these studios. But these are typical studios at, at the bar, but it's, it, we quite often have to go past them and say that they have to tidy up. But otherwise, it's, it's, it's this kind of lovely mess of, of people's projects kind of happening on them. Uh, on, on their desks, the drawings hung on the cork walls and stuff like that. It's really lovely. I think it's worth saying that um, for, the, for those who don't know in particular detail, uh, the, the unit that we teach is an undergraduate unit, so it's a degree unit, and we're teaching vertically typically in years second and third year of their, of their degrees are being taught together. So within a studio you'll have um, somewhere between 14 and 16 um, uh, architects, uh, training architects, and they will be organized vertically in, in second and third year. So that collegiate experience of learning happens vertically. So, so third years are um, by osmosis learning from one another, but also second years are skilling and learning skills through the direct exposure. And so that um, of, of the third years that they're sitting around. So in this, this scenario here, you see in equal mix of second and third years in, that, in those two images. That's, it's one studio that's sort of a central divider, there's two images of the two corridors in it. But those studios are, are open plan and, and certainly in our unit we very much encourage that that communal space where students are working together that's been a real challenge for i'm sure like everyone teaching and learning in the last two years or 18 months of covid finding those equivalent um social spaces or spaces where if you like yeah. happenstance and accidental or um passive learning happens and that, that's been much much more challenging so, so I guess it's kind of, that's true. And every bit of work that you'll see is second or third year. And we say it on the slide, you know, which student work uh, or which, which year the student is in. But it's, it's also actually interesting because the balance can be quite different. Sometimes the, the, second, the third year is the graduating year in, the, in your degree, right, before doing your master's or your years out. And it basically means that um, quite often second years are not afraid of starting at projects, whereas the third years are like, oh, this has to be the, the best project ever. And, and, and quite often you see a dynamic where, the, where in the beginning of the year, the second years are actually advancing quicker than the third years because they're not afraid to start because it doesn't really matter. And, and then the third years catches up. And that dynamic is actually really lovely as well. That is not always just that, 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 the, that the most kind of, I guess, experienced years are ahead of the game always. It, there's a real sort of nice dialogue between that. So we're going to show you some, some examples of students' work because I think it's easier for us to talk about the studio through the, through the work at, in, our, in our unit. And it basically means that it, rather than talking particularly about the project, there's one at the end Matt can talk about a little bit more in detail. But otherwise, we just want to show you examples of how the studio is, is working. Sorry, I can't get this scene here. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. So um, we start with a third year project uh, by a guy called George, uh, which was set in Chicago in a quite a poor area. Uh, and I think George had this like incredible um, ability to sort of say, well, you know, can we put a school that lies in the middle of, um, of all these like um, social facilities and use those facilities as to say local calf becomes the canteen of the school or, you know, the already existing football ground becomes the, the, the playing ground for this school. Well, so we just need to facilitate classrooms and some common experiences um, be be between gluing these kind of things together. And he did this kind of, it was, it was a lovely thing actually, these kind of almost like a, a, a lots of interiors within this bigger shed, I guess, in a, in a cold environment, Chicago gets cold in winter. 
And, and I don't know where you can see it, but it sort of lies in between and it then uses all the facilities around it as this kind of, as this hub. In the evenings, the school could then turn into be something else um, for, for the community, uh, which was quite interesting because there was a lot of plots um, which were empty. It was a, you know, houses had been there and then the area had gone down in value and, and, and things were sparse. So, but George kind of, he was quite good at making something that was incredibly buildable. And we, I guess our, our briefs in the year, although they always change, it's essentially the same thing. We want people to make community buildings that, has, that, that houses something, like the school is a good example of housing the local community as well as the kids and changing its, its program all the time to accommodate that kind of shift. And that's, that's been a, a current thing, right? Yeah, so in terms of, again, sort of the practicalities of, of, of organisation and structure, as Johan says, within any particular academic year, we will introduce a sort of thematic agenda. Um, and that might be a t strong title. It might be something like the embassy, or it might be that uh, we want to look at uh, the architecture of sort of social exchange. Um, and in this particular year, that was something like that. And... But the individual students, for the benefits of people listening and not knowing about these different oh, yeah, particular yeah. ways of, of, of teaching, the student then um, develops their, their own, um, I guess, field of research that they, within that thematic agenda for the year that they want to explore. And, and broadly in the, in, in the Bartlett and in our unit, that's divided into two principal sort of um, packages of work. They, they do a, a preliminary sort of um, design project and somehow what um, sort of research for the principal design project, which happens between um, Christmas and then the, the summer sort of submission. Um, but, the, but the individual brief, so with any one year sitting under the umbrella of the thematic agenda of, of our unit within many other units, um, the students are choosing their own own projects and their own sites. Yeah, and and obviously before COVID, we went to a, we would we would usually place the main project in the place of the field trip. But it basically meant that people had to find their own sites and develop their own pre brief that was sort of meaningful to the social construct of their local environment. And was, it kind of worked quite, um, quite well. And th this was Aggie, and she did this uh, place in New York. It was, uh, I think it was the Lower East Side, wasn't it? Yeah. That's what I remember, in Manhattan. It was a big site, and she developed that into a kind of, um, uh, I guess, substitute um, uh, living for, for art students, I guess it was, mm. right? So... Um, with, with these ideas of a, almost like creating this campus for, uh, for, for an art school in the middle of the city with these sort of exercise tracks on the top. But she was very engaged in, um, in both model making and quite often we see the model making not as this, as this final thing, but it was quite nice to see how she used it as this thing. You can see it here, printing some plans and copying and pasting into it and cutting out with scissors as well as doing it with a scalpel to make models that aren't necessarily so hard to alter. And throughout the year, this model developed into this building that she ended up with that you saw in the brief before. And then a few kind of um, local um, or, or more kind of intense shots of what this interior is about. I guess any student projects, you won't be able to show everything because you're sort of a one man band with a project that essentially would take an office about 20 people to create. So it's very much about kind of almost stitching together little bits that makes the reader believe that you have actually thought everything out. It's like a competition almost, right? Like an architectural competition that you show enough to suspend the disbelief of the reader as if it's a coherent project. But there are lots of gaps, right? It's just the fact that there's a well-working plan, which we want. There's technology that works. Um, and then trying to sort of develop the architecture through these 3D views. This is a second year project that was developed I mean, we're just showing different methods, I guess, because it was sort of, she fell in, like second years weren't have been in, at the ball at that time, wasn't, they weren't really exposed to computer um, generating software that much. So she did this computer generated drawing and then she painted on top of it, <laughs> which I, we actually thought was quite a nice successful way of getting her voice back into the otherwise sort of slightly dead drawing. And same here, Sam had um, um, put it, an example of a, a town hall in New York, in Manhattan, that somehow tried to represent the five boroughs in one building, a little bit postmodern, I guess. Um, and, and, and he did these hand drawings on the side that are all about this kind of idea of the different boroughs in New York. So they, they were constructs of the feel of a place and then tried to translate that into a more computer generated world, I guess. But I think, Johan, just touch it. Yeah. Uh, well, no, no, you can move on side yeah. if you want, but this idea, um, again, within the pattern of 
of, of teaching, but also the way in which our students are expressing themselves. This, this time dedicated to storytelling in the production of information yeah. that is made is absolutely critical to, to, the, to the paper project, to the project that exists um, only in, in model and, and drawn form. And so um, try and give students space to eke out their own and um, own ways of doing that um, and particularities. And again, in this case here, Jaron, sorry, I'm sort of jumping in, but ja Jaron was someone that was quite proficient with computers, which was really sort of struggling to find a kind of convincing language for that. And then um, at least on the other side here, a student from this this year, student really struggling with a kind of computer language uh, or using computers as a sophisticated tool. <laughs> I think someone's mic's on. Um, but um, the, uh, the finding a, a way of feeling comfortable in your own skin, and this for her was about mixing these two things. And I, I think that's for us is what a lot of our work is, has this collide of those two. Yeah, I guess that's it. And, and, and actually the, um, the, the, there are certain things that are very helpful tools, right? To kind of create a nice pair and stuff. But, but actually it's, it's a kind of for us to try and uh, ask enough questions from the students about what kind of media they feel most comfortable with. And if something doesn't work, you shift, right? And you try something else. But yeah, it's absolutely critical that they have time at the end to essentially have a finished building and then try and sort of develop the last bit through more three-dimensional uh, explorations. This was a student who um, throughout the year actually added to this model. He created this almost, Pete created this uh, almost like a, a cabinet of curiosity. It was a, it was a um, proposal for um, a, a new kind of Trump uh, headquarters in New York uh, because he couldn't be bothered to sort of go to Washington. It was very current in, in 17. Well, right? prophetic. I mean, it, Trump had only just come to power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was about him always blocking the streets of New York, trying to get out of it. Our field trip was there that year, which was quite lucky. Uh, but he, every time he developed a bit of, the, of, of a corner of the building, he would then enter it back into the model. And throughout the year, it became this kind of, almost this sort of example of, of the model carrying all the stories that, that were then explained in, in other drawings like this one. And this was actually him imagining this building as a part ruin, I guess, uh, as a slightly arrogant kind of way of seeing this building being more meaningful than it was. Um, so yeah, they, it's kind of quite successful. And that's a, that's a second year student from this year. In a similar way, creating a, a larger model uh, that is being added to throughout the year it was kind of interesting because you know the the world has been shifted now that people were able to sort of work from home and the financial district canary wharf in um, in, uh, in in london during lockdown it was completely dead so he was reimagining this place not being used for offices anymore and how you could break those buildings down to use the elements of those buildings to create housing basically so that was this thing while Canary Wolf was being dismantled in the background, he would then build up his, his world. So I think that just pause on there a second, because I think it's really interesting, this kind of conversation here was that this, this work and the production of this model, which is both, um, well, it's a series of models that are composited together in the same way that Pete did his, but this is a model that's produced um, in isolation, in literally in someone's bedroom in a, in a, in a student flat in London. Yeah. And then shipped with his dad in the back of a van to its site, its, it's site it was actually proposed for. And then, then the, so there's a sort of, he made this film, which is a sort of play on that. But this model that can be uh, a, a tool for telling stories and be something as exquisite as you see in the bottom right hand corner, a sort of a very specific moment of that. But enabling him to, if you like, unravel a, a story about telling something. And I think that's a real differentiator. A lot of our models, that's one element of the model that was in that. So that big sort of narrative model is, is, is embedded with a series of individual fragments, which are quite conventional yeah, architectural yeah, yeah. models. That's it. Even the plan was actually quite straightforward, but it kind of became a more imaginative drawing here in this perspective, half perspective, uh, half plan drawing that he did on that one side. Uh, Kai, I still don't really know what Kai's project was about, but I think it's something, it was, it was like a, he was second year who just really liked hand drawing, so he did this plan quite early on, and I, I think in some ways we just let him do it. It was a research centre slash community place in Greenland. He was very fascinated with all these kind of, I mean, you, you know, like, I don't know what's going on inside Kai's head, but, but, but you know, it obviously, this is what his brain looks like. And he, he then also ended up with these quite incredible renders of this, this hot, I guess, um, trying to make it more human in this hostile environment. And technically, it actually was really sophisticated, wasn't it? It was very interesting how he had that 
had that sense of making a machine that was also had this like softer side to it and exploring his thinking almost through this like you know um you know the weird collaging architecture I think, I think it's a really good example of a student who um and i think we kind of hopefully encourage that 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 when uh, johan just said this thing of like we 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 hopefully are, our role is as tutors as, as uh, he said at the beginning is as curators not as authors of or co-authors of pieces of work yeah um and kai is one of those guys who whose brain is like a complete sponge at this stage of his, his development as an architect and actually would come a week on week on week i mean we're showing you three slides of probably let's say 150 pages of portfolio which is just too much right and so um but someone that's so hungry for that it's just a pleasure then to be able to say actually hit st step back try and look at this thing objectively and actually yeah. in a curious way lessons learned from the last year or year or so of covid is certainly within more broadly within the Bartlett school but certainly within our unit is the the shift from the portfolio being a physical artifact or often of, of many many pages you know for a second or third year student third year student it might quite normally be 100 150 pages which actually um had sort of failed ever to or it was a sort of muscle flexing exercise as much as anything else and actually we we made very active decisions within teaching with the ballot to simplify and reduce the number of pages that students were doing and actually that editorial process led a lot of the time to a real distillation in thinking and it forced students to be much more strategic about the stories they were telling and that's been a, i think making them better architects it, it, it's 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 sorry it has been a real tool in making them better communicators of their ideas i think that's their ideas yeah more, architects. more sync sync i think in terms of timing we might just sort of go through these ones oh okay uh, need need um Neve sort of showing an example of a um, okay yeah, yeah I guess a, a, a really lovely example of a um, of, of just it was a co-housing scheme for elderly and for uh, for for sort of nurseries basically kind of mixed together um, because you you know of these kind of latest studies of, of those two groups actually having a beneficial um, uh, time together and, and living close to each other that was in in Prague. But Neve slaved through plans over and over again. And it was just really lovely to see that we, we you know, you had someone like Kai doing these like fantastical projects, but at the same time, you've got someone like Neve who just really sorts a building out to a, a really high level. And that is equally applauded in our unit, right? Like if someone comes on a plan like that, we're, we're pretty happy. And the same thing as, as seeing some sort of weird drawing from Kai, right? So that, that was a good example of actually doesn't all need to be crazy. It can be so so neatly done and and well worked out. And same thing with Will, I guess. Coming, um, he he uh, he had placed himself in a in a in near coastline in in the UK that is slowly being eroded by the sea. So he was talking about how the local community there would have to change their way of living throughout the years and given them an architecture that could cope with it. Um, something that Matt would talk about with Annabelle's project in a, in a minute, but. Um, it kind of created this kind of new idea of suburban life, you know, in the UK at least, like what that would look like. And and Will's project was incredibly technical because the ground works for something like that in a section like this becomes incredibly detailed and has to work. His his actually his technical studies um, was almost some of his strongest work, almost stronger than the design itself, I think. Um, but then he also wanted to do these like storytelling um, drawings about what the life was in the building. So, and I guess that's what we were on about that actually we try and um, have, have give the students about two months towards the end where the building is essentially sorted out to the, to the level that you just saw in the previous slide. And then you have time to sort of explain the narrative of the building and potentially develop it through these like more three dimensional studies uh, as in this slideshow. Do you want to go for Annabelle, Matt? Yeah, yeah, fine. Well, we can we can both talk. So, yeah. Um, so we're going to end with um, a series of slides which were from a student, um, Annabelle Tan, um, who was a sort of force of nature. But uh, we we show her work because it's it's such a thorough exemplar of a kind of a way of of thinking on so many different levels. Um, it's a phenomenal piece of work for a, for a third year. We take no no real credit for 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 her for her talents, and she she. Was rightly awarded the uh, RFBA bronze medal for the um, the most outstanding piece of you know undergraduate work that that particular year, and, and she won a number of prizes in, in in within the school and and also the RFBA sustainability award. And I guess it's 
tackling or, or touching on the fact that a lot of our student projects, um, well, our studios projects, as we've touched on, it, are rooted in socially kind of considered architecture, architecture for people, for communities, uh, almost without exception, students are asked to, to put themselves in the minds of, their, of the, the community within which they're operating or proposing architecture for, and to think of the places and spaces that they make from, from the inside out. And this is, uh, this is an example of, of, of that, um, I guess, in extremis. Um, Annabelle um, and the students in the unit that year were, um, were working in New Orleans. Uh, this is a glimpse of her final, um, final model, but we'll come back to that in, in a minute. But was seeded, it's called Wetland Frontier. And, it, and actually, these are, it's quite helpful because it's, this is, these are the slides she gave to the IRBA, and it's a condensed version of a very large portfolio. But it actually it, yes. it shows the project as a portfolio. So I think what's, what's interesting in this case, yeah. I think Annabelle had a, um, her portfolio consisted of um, probably 50 models, one of which was about three and a half meters long, um, a drawing, a physical drawing that was about five meters long at one to 50, um, about uh, 200 pages and uh, and then just zillions of these technical reports. She was a kind of a real kind of human phenomenon, but actually it was this process of distilling that into, into eight or 10 pages that, that really nailed it, I think for us to be able to tell us. Anyway, the story. Um, set in New Orleans in, 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 uh, in the bayou, an area of um, wetland transition that really been suffered under uh, Hurricane Katrina 10 years ago. It's always been the place of location for um, uh, the, the poor, or initially the slave, black, black slave community within New Orleans and now the, the poor black community there. And uh, her architecture is about um, that, that, that site in that area now 10 years on, 15 years on from Katrina is still underdeveloped, underoccupied because it hasn't had the resources and the protection that lots of other parts of the city have had. And her scheme is about uh, reimagining that, seeing this as a catalyst for, for um, tidal wetlands throughout the world um, and, and finding an infrastructure that um, regrows um, and cre recreates natural cedar wood um, uh, forests around that, that area, allowing um, a more a natural ecosystem to support um, flood protection. Uh, oh, hang on, sorry. Keeps, uh, and she started this, this work off by, by a whole series, you see on the left-hand side here, a whole series of sort of pamphlets where she really researched this in, in, in very much detail. She touched on here, there's key themes of the economy, um, looking at the environment, the recreation of that space. And I mean, these are emblematic of, of the explorations that she, she did. But she was looking at this sort of denuded landscape and, and ways in which it could be repopulated um, environmentally, which would then in turn lead to a repopulation uh, socially and, um, sorry. Yeah, it's a bit annoying. There you go. Yeah. Um, and again, one of the strengths of, of Annabelle and, and many of our students, but this is exemplified here, is, is tackling a problem or tackling a brief on many different scales at once. So on the bottom left of this slide, uh, Annabelle's thinking about this whole, whole program within a much wider kind of urban context of the city, um, the connection of the, the wetland area here to the, to the, rest, of the, um, the rest of the context. But at the same time, she's really at the right at the beginning of that project, she's thinking about the kind of, you know, the sort of macro world of the planning of that particular quarter. She's making paper models at the same time that she's starting this epic drawing. You won't be able to see that here, but. This is this drawing, which is the, the five metre long drawing that she again, she started and worked into it. And as she was developing ideas, she would test them out on this sort of mural that was in, in, in a corridor within the building within which we, we all worked. Um, and um, the, the, the richness of this project was that she had, um, in the way that student project does, but with kind of real convincing rigour, um, looked at the sort of technical side of this at a great level of depth. Um, so she's not looking at the sort of social, economic, the sort of the aesthetic kind of design kind of parameters here. She's really looking at how the physicality of this thing would be delivered. I mean, there's some pseudoscience there as there always is with student projects, but it's, it's really, really rigorous and looked at and explored in many different ways. And illustrating her sheets are these are these series of beautiful renders that she does, actually just very simply made from a computer model, but then she draws in this life, this imagined life and this occupation. And again, it's this, 
it's this sense of community and believing it and being there that comes through those those pieces of work that's absolutely critical um she looks at this idea of of actually the physicality of the architecture on a small scale low carbon um you know uh timber framed infrastructure but the way in which you can make that hurricane proof you do that by making the buildings adaptable but building on local vernacular so there's a sort of common language between the existing and the proposed um uh and again always diving in between drawings the bottom left hand corner digital modeling and then this is you know an exquisite one to 20 physical model so these things never exist in in separation with her and it's this kind of cross fertilization of ideas um and then always testing that against this is a kind of macro model of the whole, whole urban infrastructure which just i mean on your screens it's going to be almost inconsequential but, it, but again significant pieces of work in in their, their own right um so our progression is not working on our buttons at the moment um and again looking at this idea that that through parts of this architecture that would um inhabit the bayou um she looked at sort of sediment building architecture these beautiful studies she made in her technical study about building a um uh, architectural sort of skin for the building out of the clay from the bayou which over time as these these the the trees started to establish would would degrade over time and and re-emerge within or reinvest within the landscape but establish a more permanent infrastructure for for occupation and more illustrations of this sort of incredible kind of piece of work and then she she culminated that uh, she culminated that process in in a, in a model which uh, she made again over a period of time, but that uh, she tested a number of different things out, out of, on this, but this really beautiful final model, which um, actually was, we, we're, we're not gonna have time to go in a huge amount of detail on the way we're just over half an hour. So we're finishing up now, last slide or so. This was uh, actually a time-based model. So we're seeing, we're, seeing, um, we're seeing different quadrants of the development of the site at different times. And so to bring this kind of time-based uh, architecture, explaining this sort of shifting, changing landscape in a single model form that, again, um, Annabelle was able to use as a sort of physical device to, to stand around, theatrical device to talk about her work to her external examiners um, was a really important part of that. I guess that in it, we got it, there's a unit Instagram if you want to see more, more in-depth work, but we, we um, I guess we hopefully through these slides can, can start tell the story that every year we start with a new set of students that that's the way the boundary works that second and third years always have to shift units between their years and it basically means that um that we do not know what the year is going to look like at the end and that's the exciting part for Matt and I right that there's such a variety of styles and media different things all kind of I guess just governed by this idea of a social engagement and most exciting I mean this year we're about to we're about to meet physically meet our first uh, our, our cohort students for this coming year and actually we're 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 engaging with a, a new program called MSI within the within the Bartlett that's teaching uh, we will teach in the same way that we've always taught but this year is super exciting um, it could be really it's just exciting and scary what we're teaching the whole year um, is in pairs so the so the project is paired for the entire year so um, come back to us at the end of nine months and we'll tell you it's been a success. <laughs> yeah, everyone's dead. Okay, okay cool. that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It is very interesting. Oh, just one quick question before I move to Julia. Could you please, uh, because you always been, you mentioned about second year and third year. So basically at Bartlett, the second year and third year is in one unit. Yeah, correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so you have about... 13 or 14 design units with different tutors and then you're mixing. So first years taught together as one big group with different tutors and they give us this base structure. And then second and third year is, is taught together in these units. And, and the, the rule is when you, when you change from your second to your third year, you have to change unit as well so that you, you get a different experience in each of those okay. years, right? Then you take your years out in practices and then you go back to the masters. And then right? in masters, in masters it's, I guess it's much more sort of, in some ways, a research led and students, um, most students choose to stay in the same unit for two years. So yeah. there's a sort of, there's a body of work, a way of, a way of processing, thinking about architecture that you, can, that you can have sort of 24 months to think about rather than 12. That's it. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Let's discuss about that further later. Okay, okay let's now move to Julia from Milan. 
Uh, so the time is yours, Julia. Thank you, thank you, thank you, David, for the for the invitation. I um, uh, and to be to be part of uh, of this talk. I'm just uh, sharing the presentation uh, in one moment. I think now it's uh, it's visible. Uh, to you, uh, so I I've tried to uh, to to answer to some of the questions that you were explaining uh, were, were posing to me at the beginning of this uh, uh, of this talk uh, when we 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 were being in, in touch to try to um, summarize and uh, think uh, reflect on what I did in uh, in the studio. So it was a good exercise, I think, also yeah. to me because uh, you usually we, we are not able to do that. So we we run uh, rather than. Uh, thinking too much. So I'm, I'm teaching in Politecnico di Milano and I'm a, a researcher in architectural design. And today I'm talking about especially of two experience, I would say, uh, because um, I, I would uh, plenty explain the work that I do in my studio in uh, Politecnico. Uh, but also at the end, I would also uh, shorter present uh, an experience that I did uh, teaching in, uh, in Abedabad in the School of Architecture uh, uh, made by Doshi that is called SET. I spent one year uh, teaching over there in 2014 and um, it was in a way very strange because I started to teach officially in India and not in Italy. So I had to, in a way, uh, re reset my, the way in which I was used to, I was trained you know, to, uh, to image and to consider the project and the, the tools to, to, make, uh, uh, to make an architecture. Of course, these are the two places. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with some of these iconic images, not the, the party of the School of Architecture in Milan, that is a kind of open atelier in which the students uh, 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 hardly work and spend time of, on their project and on the other side you have the um... Uh, the School of Architecture of, uh, of in Ahmedabad with these uh, iconic uh, concrete and brick uh, buildings from the from the from the 60s because the school was uh, was built in that time. Uh, so to to start, uh, let's say with uh, with these two experiences, the first one is the more uh, let's say I would say um, regular one, and I'm also I was very fascinated from the presentation uh, uh, from my colleagues because I I think it's very interesting to compare also the way of uh, teaching you know i'm uh, doing a, I, now i'm doing a studio in the first year but what you are what you what you you will see in the presentation comes from uh, uh, the second year uh, studio, architectural design studio that i taught uh, in the bachelor of architectural design in milan from 2014 uh, for six years and what is different what is very interesting i think is that this, the structure of our studio is based on one year so it's a longer stretch. So we are uh, teaching to the same students for two semesters and we are not mixing the second and third year. So in a way, it's very, uh, I would say, it's a longer span of time in which we are uh, discussing and uh, uh, working with the same bunch of students that sometimes become uh, like a kind of training for, uh, for yourself. It's a very long exposure. And at the end of the presentation, I would briefly present some of the, uh, of the courses that I was teaching in, uh, in Ahmedabad in India. I have decided uh, for purpose to not uh, present the studio works, but to present the work that I was conducting in some elective courses or seminar courses that are very interesting to me because they are in the edge between the, the design, the purely design approach and the theoretical one. And I think that was also in a way a training uh, that I applied when, when I came back to, uh, to Milan, when I came back to, to Italy uh, and I was uh, uh, taking my, my, first, uh, my first studio. Um, how, to, how to start? So usually I, I take the design studio uh, uh, with a methodology that is split into three exercises. Uh, the first two, as you can see, are more uh, uh, abstract and they are uh, uh, kind of warm up exercise that I give to the students at the beginning uh, to also um, make them familiar with the concept of space and working a lot with the abstraction because what I what I felt sometimes in the student is a kind of detachment from uh, the capacity to to abstract, to to think, uh, even out of the box. You know? So these two exercises are meant to uh, voluntarily detach them from the from the reality. And in the third exercise, that is the longer project that the, the students usually. Uh, 
work on for let's say six months uh, including some uh, uh, breaks uh, it's actually the longer and deeper project in which they work on a, on a specific context in the usually in the city of Milan uh, common topic for all the uh, exercises is the housing in in Milan we are very uh, in a way focused on uh, working on the housing uh, uh, problems on the housing design especially in the first and second year of the bachelor so we give to them in a way tools to move ahead for the uh, for other topics they could explore in in other courses so in a way this is a choice but it's also kind of compulsory i i i believe that and also part of my research is also related to to that so i, I start uh, usually with this first exercise that i call the cube as a space um, and it's a very fast exercise that runs for one week only uh, it's just to know the students and to, uh, in a way, give to them uh, some tool um, to refresh their uh, uh, knowledge you know, uh, of architecture that, of course, they have built during the first year. As you can see, it, there are some rules that I, I give to students. So I invite them to uh, consider two options when they are making this cube. The cube is very simple. It's an object of 15, by 15 centimeter and 15 centimeter. So it's... Uh, a volume actually uh, and I want to them I encourage them to work uh, within the model from the beginning so uh, in these in these two first exercise the model is actually the real object and as you can see they, they I'm not reading that but the instruction let's say are very simple so I ask them to make some action on this cube and to also consider that this action could be related to architectural elements they are not uh, the cube doesn't have to be a building but it has to recall some architectural idea uh, the cube has to be uh, uh, placed on the ground so it has to be a north and side the south direction and they have to at least uh, keep two uh, side uh, without any touch uh, what i uh, so i give to students some some examples some ideas of how they could proceed you know, in order to uh, break uh, the eyes and I also, also ask them to uh, consider to choose if they want to consider the cube as uh, a volume or if they want to consider the cube as a surface and that is uh, uh, the first you know, uh, sliding doors for them so they could uh, uh, basically decide if they want to completely deconstruct the cube that they have in their hand or if they want to keep the idea of the uh, of the space and of the module so if uh, uh, they choose the the second option the the condition of the surface they have basically to open up you know, to decompose the, the cube uh, in the sixth side and then they have to recombine it uh, giving some uh, uh, making this action or uh, to insert to cut to fold but at the same time i ask them to consider a continuity so they have to either work on the continuity of the surface of the cube or with the void continuity so i ask uh, them also to reflect critically about uh, what what they are doing you know what is the final uh, uh, project that they they would like to have in mind as i told you it's very these are the instructions for the the surface so as you can see also uh, we made it, you know, but uh, uh, we give to the student as a as a kind of uh, IKEA um, guidelines, and you know, also they can have a, uh, a reference. And as you can see, they, uh, the two cubes looks completely different. Also, you know? the 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 surface one it's more uh, the constructive, while the uh, the volume one recalls in a in a way the idea of a room of a domestic space that we can also uh, inhabit. And the students start to, to work on them. So as you can see, beside the model, I ask them to make drawings, to make sketches that are uh, explaining the process. No? So since I'm asking to make action on, the, on this uh, uh, object, I would like uh, uh, to invite them to, trans to translate this uh, action into drawings. So you see here some, uh, uh, some different sketches. Also students that uh, made a lot of sketches in the study book to understand uh, uh, the better shape for the for the project for the cube that they they have in mind and go closer now you see that this is one of the uh, volume approach you know that uh, uh, recalls uh, uh, the idea of some uh, 
uh, spaces of some uh, rooms uh, in a way and also you see the the process not the the developing uh, uh, process that the, the the students move on uh, this first exercise is uh, uh, carried out individually by the students so i ask them to not work in group that is very uh, common in the in the let's say in the italian context in milan as well especially because we are used to have uh, bigger class uh, classes with uh, 50 55 students so uh, this uh, uh, class was even sh smaller for the for the number but it's very difficult to uh, make them work individually throughout all the year while at the beginning it's quite uh, it's quite interesting and, and more simple for us so as you can see you know the variety of options that arrive to the end are uh, very uh, funny but also very different you know? so uh, you see the complete uh, the composition of the cube or uh, and or the opposite the idea that the cubes become and stay remain as a as a as a private entity and we cannot even see inside uh, or the, the some of them works more with some idea of a section uh, that again recalls probably a building or something that could be related to to a building the second exercise is uh, uh, following the first one so i ask uh, i give to the students uh, more materials no so uh, this exercise uh, it's called nine cubes experiment and it's uh, in a way it recalls also uh, a very strong uh, uh, phil teaching philosophy on the on the works on the cubes that was also uh, run in many many years by francesco venezia in uh, at the u of in venice so it's not a uh, an original exercise but it's something that i i modified a bit to, to to fit uh, to, to my course so i give to the uh, to the students nine cubes and uh, as you can see each cube is uh, three meter by three meter by three meter so at the end each unit could be ideally considered or image as a as a room as a space uh, I ask them to, uh, to make a process uh, to add uh, this nine cube uh, to define a house. So I'm not giving uh, uh, a program, so I'm not giving uh, the owner of the house and they have to make the story. So they have to image who is the owner of the house, uh, but they have to uh, strictly uh, image the space as a house that can be also split with uh, uh, different rooms and also uh, they can also uh, work in, uh, in an ideal space. And uh, the, other, the other rules that are uh, very important uh, are related to the, uh, to the context. No? Uh, so there is no uh, site, there is no specific context that we can uh, that we can refer to the uh, to the project that we can refer to to the location of the uh, of the nine cubes uh, they are working in an abstract cloud uh, but they have uh, uh, in their hands 81 square meters and the last rule is that at least three cubes has to be connected together so they cannot make a sprawl of uh, uh, nine cubes in the space but they have to uh, combine them and as you can see there are some uh, some questions that I ask them uh, who is the owner of the, your house what is the story behind uh, they have to image a storytelling so I'm pushing them to uh, to image you know so to uh, to move on the uh, on this line I'm just uh, uh, breaking the condivision and redo it because there were some lines on the on the slide so I think it's uh, uh, probably uh, easier if I do it. Uh, you, you can see it now. Is it uh, visible? Okay, perfect. So these are yes, some of the... Thank you. These are some of the, of the results. Uh, I just uh, select randomly some uh, uh, sheets uh, that, I, that the students made uh, in which you see the, the process. Now you see uh, how they uh, start to uh, work on the diagrams of the cube. They made some rotation. Uh, at some point, uh, I ask them to image in a context. So I'm not giving a place, but I ask them to image if it's a real place, it's an abstraction, it's uh, in the nature, it's in the city. 
So for example, these students you know, were really fascinating from the, uh, from the existing uh, uh, city you know, and they decided to, uh, to place their composition of cubes that looks uh, as, a, uh, as a synthesis of a of housing complex in the, uh, in the center. And here you see the, the model. At the beginning, I was asked them to make cluster model to uh, image uh, uh, make a synthesis of the pure shape of the, um, of the volume uh, further on, especially in the last uh, year due to the situation models were uh, unfortunately not so easy to be made but then they also made uh, uh, drawings they make uh, proper uh, technical drawings because at the end uh, these 81 square meters could really be uh, an housing uh, space and as you can see for example from this image drawings are very simple uh, they are in black and white and they just uh, underline the, the the most important elements of the composition the walls uh, the openings of course uh, uh, these are the first attempt for the students to image uh, the real composition of the of the project but uh, you see some some effort and also I push them to work with the axonometry. So as you can see uh, in this image at the end, we can still recall uh, the nine cubes and you know, we can still identify the cubes from which the student starts, but we can also uh, image and understand the space that they want to create. Uh, at the last rush of this exercise, uh, if the student, the class is uh, following, I ask them to make, uh, to add uh, one uh, new element um, an architectural element, it could be a stairs, it could be a wall, it could be the courtyard. Here there is a combination of all these elements because this group of students was particularly, were particularly uh, answering to the, to, the, to the challenge of the, of the project. So they worked on the addition of a wall that designed a precise uh, uh, courtyard and in a way uh, makes this project feeling actually uh, real. Uh, but other, uh, uh, other projects were more uh, abstract, were more uh, uh, strongly connected to the, to the emphasizing of the, of the cube itself. So you see here, for example, this was uh, conceived as a space for students in which they could uh, spend uh, their night like a, a refugee. And uh, the composition in, in elevation was also working with the rotation of some of the cubes. So uh, the, uh, the idea uh, and the, the funny aspect of the project was to, uh, in a way, um, take uh, out from the box, no? think out of the box, uh, the, compo the composition of these, uh, of these elements. And you can see also uh, in, uh, in this manifesto, no? in this um, iconic drawing, uh, what the students were thinking about. No? They were imagining this kind of refugee in a, in a forest, in a kind of very uh, um, maybe hidden place that you could uh, discover and you could uh, uh, feel the sense of being in the nature, uh, staying in this uh, uh, small uh, volume with a backspace that was conceived as a, uh, as a, common, uh, as a common area. Uh, other examples, uh, students also playing along with the uh, with models so they the, with the materials so they uh, start to consider this cube as a, a real object and uh, uh, also they were imagining the the site and also you see uh, some uh, some suggestion of sites that were of course uh, uh, are not real but they are just uh, an imagination of what they uh, they have in their mind and uh, also uh, how they adapt their project to to an existing site or to an imagined site uh, after the first, uh, um, let's say the first idea, no? the first concept. This is another one in which again, uh, uh, the students were uh, really engaged from the beginning on working with level. So as you can see, the cubes are combined uh, to create uh, uh, a composition that works with different levels and in the end they image a site that is a kind of hill of a, with a slope and they works a lot uh, with the addition of the of the circulation so they were thinking about how to uh, reach uh, uh, how to enter in this composition from the top to the bottom and, and how, how to climb it. So the, in this case, the additional elements could be uh, recalled to the, to the stairs or to, or to the ramp. 
and this is one of the of the image of the class in, uh, in which we were used to uh, show up the models uh, discuss with drawings. Uh, uh, usually we uh, collect, we were used to discuss together the, the single cube and the nine cubes because uh, in a way they were, we were considered this work as a continuity, uh, as a, an evolution in a way. No? So we, you start from uh, one object and then you have nine smaller objects that you have to uh, combine um, and you, you also start to translate uh, the abstraction of the space that uh, has been uh, uh, related to the first exercise to the second to the second one in which uh, the space become more uh, more complex and articulated going to the uh, to the to the core let's say of the of the studio the the third exercise uh, um, is the uh, I, I used to call it the longer project with my students because it's the one in which uh, they they have to of course put the most of the energy uh, and the, there is a shift because uh, I start uh, from the site so I start to ask to the students to uh, strongly read and understand the context so the place in which they have to make the project so for the students is usually a very uh, difficult thing because uh, I push them for uh, uh, let's say two three months to work in abstract and then they have to come to move to the real uh, shape of the city uh, as I said the topic is uh, the house again but it's more uh, complex it's an housing uh, unit uh, usually I combine uh, the housing function with a public uh, element uh, in the last year it was a market for example and I divide the, stud the studio in some phases that you you can also uh, see uh, written here. So the first one is uh, the idea to interpret, to read uh, the site, the context, to understand it uh, in order to define a specific program. So even for the housing uh, unit, uh, of course, the concept phase and the, 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 the definition of the, of the core, of the bigger idea, and then the development with the following some of the canonics drawings that we, we all are uh, uh, using uh, um, aware of. And of course, tools. You know? um, I push a lot of students to work in axonometry. I, I strongly uh, believe that this way, especially uh, in, the, in the first year, it's very interesting and important because it helps them to draw the old building and to have an idea of the, of the, of the space itself models drawing uh, uh, that we also have, have seen uh, uh, before. Just a quick run what uh what were usually the site, we work in the uh, northeast part of Milan, but uh, I usually take uh, three, three sites and I ask the students to choose. So we are not using only one site, we are uh, making some variation. The topic of the site is almost the same, so sometimes, uh, most of the time, are uh, um, residual spaces. Uh, I prefer to work into a spot in which there are also existing uh, buildings with which the students could deal uh, and could have some references. And in this case, the, the, the site were all located on the east and uh, just uh, out of the, let's say, of the main, uh, um, of the main circle that uh, uh, define uh, the center of Milan and what, what we so-called periphery. It's not a periphery, but it's uh, not uh, uh, strictly related to the city center. So I'm showing some, some results as, as also my colleague did from, uh, from, from students uh, to, that works uh, in the uh, in two different sites. So I start with the, uh, with this first site that is uh, uh, via Rombon and it's close to the uh, to the railway station of Valambrate. It's not so important the name, but it's uh, probably more interesting to to see the process. No? So as I said before, uh, I moved completely the, the methodology. You know? The student starts from the reading of the city, from the reading of the of the site. They have to understand the, for example, the architectural typology. You, you see it here very very clearly you know what are the materials that are making this site and how you can uh, deal with them when you have to make your own project that is the question what is the role of the open spaces if they are in this case uh, there were a lot of empty and open spaces uh, surrounding the site and they ask them to think about the border the edges of the plot to to strongly uh, feel the condition and the uh, of the surrounding so what you what you end up at the, at the end uh, is uh, you see some drawings here that are uh, uh, making uh, uh, the first concept the first uh, 
uh, idea. So the, in this case, the students really want to, in a way, ideally complete uh, and recreate a courtyard uh, with the addition of uh, a new buildings, but also the idea to sign, uh, to make a vertical element, a tower, because the, 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 this uh, part of the city is very flat, that are, there are no uh, strong landmark that could uh, uh, recall uh, uh, this place. And they really work hard on the, on the open spaces. You, know, you see it uh, clearly, you know, the, the site is quite uh, uh, big, so they have the necessity to create a composition to really uh, shape uh, this, new, this new part of the, of the city. Of course, uh, drawings, uh, you, you see the developments of some most important drawings of so the ground floor plan. Uh, here, you know, the, there is the, the market, so the public function that we ask uh, uh, students to think about, the, to think about it. Uh, we usually do that because in the structure of the studio in Milan, the, um, let's say the, uh, the co-teacher, is a structural professor. So students are pushed and in the second year to start to understand that the building needs to stay, uh, to, be, to, to have structural elements you know, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that are defining uh, its structure. So that's why I was including the market because it's a very interesting uh, topic also from the, from the structural point of view. Um, and here you see some of some of the elevations, some of the uh, language that the, these two girls uh, wanted to uh, wanted to achieve. They refer to the uh, tradition of uh, uh, the modern buildings in Milan, uh, in which uh, you you might uh, uh, see, you might have been familiar with the, with this tradition. We have this uh, basement uh, that sometimes has a different material, but also the idea to. Uh, work on a pattern that could identify the buildings, the housing complex in vertical. Um, and uh, also they were in work experimenting, let's say, on the materials for the, for the market. So they imaged the market as a semi-translucent uh, uh, box uh, that was uh, uh, able to be the center of the new, of the new public, uh, public space. Uh, I asked them to make an axonometry, you know, to understand uh, uh, the proportion, to understand even how the buildings deals with the existing context. You, you can see how they have tried to be, in a way, silent, you know, to recall some of the typological feature of the site with a, with a breaking uh, element that, that is uh, the, the, the tower. And then you see some details, some uh, uh, effort to go closer in scale 1 to 50, that usually is the uh, closer glance that we, we worked on in the in the in the design uh, in the design studio uh, and some views you know, uh, that are uh, imaging that are uh, uh, translating this space into 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 reality. The second example is uh, uh, same topic, uh, different site. And I think this is quite interesting because uh, uh, the, the site is uh, an empty, is uh, this one actually, with the, the extension of the open space towards, uh, let's say, the other end of the plot. And that is quite interesting because this is, uh, uh, is the site of a former public market that now is abandoned. Uh, so we decided, we uh, told to the students that the, the building should be demolished, but they have to keep the function of the market, of course, because it's uh, uh, one of the, uh, it was one of the key points, key reference in the, in the, in the plot of uh, Via Gorla, that is uh, a very uh, popular and traditional area of Milan. You can see from the pitch roof, no, the traditional uh, uh, style of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Italian city. Uh, so these two uh, guys decided to uh, basically create a new plaza. That was their first uh, uh, idea. Uh, they wanted to make a plaza because that is uh, uh, essentially one of the most important uh, typology in our, uh, in our city, but most of that uh, because they wanted to uh, encourage uh, um, and in a way break the continuity of the facade. No? So they were very courageous in a way because uh, uh, if you see uh, all around in this, uh, in this site, uh, the, the corner and the facade are always closed, always uh, uh, completed. And they wanted also to play with two different languages with their building. You know? So you, you see the, the possibility to attach to the existing uh, uh, blind facade and to even open completely the residential space towards uh, the, the, new, the new plaza. Uh, the 
market, they decided to have a, a market that is partially uh, up uh, on top of the plaza with this uh, linear building and partially underground. So they wanted to um, engage also the, the plaza working on, on, different, on different layers. Uh, so also in this case, you see uh, some of the reading, some of the uh, strategy that the students built up you know, related to the connection, relating to the uh, actual shape of the, of the building and uh, uh, they, they struggled a lot to understand the right proportion. Now, usually when you are working in a corner, uh, it's it difficult to uh, keep together the language of the two sides and they wanted to break it in a way. So I, I, I thought that was a very interesting uh, uh, approach, a very clever idea. And I pushed them uh, even uh, no, when, you, when you see the, the master plan, you see how uh, sometimes how strange you know, is for, the, for this place to have this corner plaza with uh, a beautiful big tree that could uh, uh, in a way create a variation in the, in the structure of the, of the city. And then you have the uh, the plans of the of the of the pla of the plaza uh, with the, the addition of uh, uh, the the corpus of the building that they want to uh, use to recreate even the the feeling of the of the court you know uh, this uh, particular location in milan uh, is full of uh, courtyard typology so that was also uh, one of the one of the features that the students wanted to to keep in their work some uh, the same more traditional drawings that are showing you the, the, the let's say what is called the ground floor uh, plan, but also some uh, other experimentation on the uh, on the housing uh, complex. Now you see um, how the students work on the on the different facade, how they wanted to uh, combine a different housing typology to uh, to have a more variation. Uh, going uh, in vertical, going through the building, and also the, the language of the facade. And as I said before, the idea to have this corner plaza was meant to uh, open the house towards the, uh, the, main, uh, the main streets. These are some elevations that are showing you the, the attention to the, uh, to the material and to the, the openings and closure of the, uh, of the buildings. Especially you see the market here, so the two, um, the two facades, the, the glass facade that are uh, creating this, uh, this public place and some uh, closer view, no? uh, experimenting more on the materials. Um, I uh, push a lot of the students to interpret the, the language of uh, the modern, uh, even the contemporary housing project in Milan, uh, there is a long uh, and strong tradition in the city that now is being revealing. So I always uh, uh, push them to, to, to study, but also to understand uh, what elements we could add to, to push the interpretation of the contemporary, contemporary project. And uh, th th these two students were really also uh, technical in a way, so they spend a lot of time to understand the, the different part of the, of the project and how it was, uh, it was able to, uh, to explain and to represent it. And of course, a final uh, a view that is uh, uh, more, um, let's say, a scenario, no? a, a, a view that uh, uh, tries to uh, interpret and uh, realize the, uh, the project together with, uh, uh, with, the, with the streets and the, and the city, of course, from the most uh, probably interesting uh, point of view. The, the closing this, uh, let's say, part, I would like to just uh, spend a couple of minutes, not more than that, uh, to, to the second experience that I was uh, introducing at the beginning because I, um, I had the possibility to take some, uh, um, some uh, individual courses, elective and seminar courses when I was uh, uh, teaching in, uh, in at SEPT University in Ahmedabad. Uh, and what was uh, uh, very interesting to me was that especially in the elect elective courses that was, that, that was uh, um, a very strong freedom in uh, defining the topic, uh, the title of the courses. Uh, so I also had the possibility to do what I, I was uh, uh, liking at that time. Uh, that was uh, the idea to understand the shape of, of cities. Uh, and in the second course that is uh, called the case studies in architectural analysis was a seminar course. Uh, and for them, the idea of the seminar course is uh, um, a course that gives in a way the, the background uh, to uh, 
to, to start to approach the design. Uh, especially uh, that course was focused on contemporary architecture. So uh, the, the method of the two courses was quite similar. Uh, it was in the, in the two cases, a way of interpreting and inquiring in the first uh, uh, course of the city, in the second one, the architecture. And the core structure was made by lectures, but also by exercise. Uh, they were not a design project because uh, it was not a studio, of course, but they were individually, let's say, um, experiment that uh, uh, I conduct with them uh, and we discuss this assignment also during the classes. You, you have to imagine uh, that this system, uh, at least for, for, for me, from uh, my background in Italy, it's quite different because uh, uh, in SEPT, the uh, attention to the, uh, let's say, assignment is very high. So in all the courses, you have this assignment that are in a way proto-design uh, phases. Uh, so th they were very, uh, very keen and very, and very important for the students. So what I did in the first course was to uh, make a thematic lecture, um, looking at cities, urban morphologies, but also looking at uh, architectural lenses to read the space. Uh, the course was called Shaping Contemporary Cities. I had around, uh, I guess, I. 45 students that selected this course among uh, a variety of options and uh, I asked them to individually make an interpretation of uh, a, on a part of a city uh, and th this city was a, a freedom uh, choice so they could make uh, their own uh, uh, choice on which city, wherever in the world. Uh, it was a mixed class also with the Erasmus students came, uh, come that were from Europe, so it was not uh, only, uh, let's say, students from India. And I give to them some categories, uh, some, uh, uh, let's say, some help uh, to read uh, these, uh, these cities. So what we end up, uh, I ask them to make uh, uh, one board, uh, A1 format, so like a manifesto. Um, there were some, uh, you can see some lenses, no connection, traces, voids, fragments. Uh, for example, these uh, students decided to work on Pondicherry in India, and she was really interested to understand the overlapping you know, between, uh, uh, let's say, the, the central core, the, the thresholds of the, uh, of, the, of the center of the city and the outside, and especially she was interested on how to, uh, of how to uh, take the trace of the uh, first settlement of Pondicherry, so the, the beginning of the, uh, of the construction of the, of the, of the city. Um, another example, more, uh, uh, even more probably fascinating, uh, um, this guy, uh, Gurav, uh, he decided to look at uh, London, uh, look at London after the, uh, make a comparison after the 1940s and the, to the present situation. So, of course, he was uh, uh, dealing and uh, addressing the, the bombing uh, that heavily destroyed London during the Second World War. He made this kind of uh, overlapping of traces uh, to uh, to critically understand the changes, but also, of course, the different density of the city. And uh, uh, that was also carried on uh, on, the, on the different lenses that I was, uh, I was giving uh, to, uh, to them. And the last example was, again, a comparison. The comparison of cities was not even uh, uh, thought by me at the beginning, but the students proposed me to make a comparison between Islamabad and uh, Jaipur. Uh, Jaipur is uh, a, an Indian city and uh, of course, uh, Islamabad is in Pakistan, but uh, he found very interesting some similarities. So the fact that uh, uh, the city, the two cities have a very strong topography, uh, they have a very uh, clear grid structure that uh, uh, in a way creates the imprinting of the, uh, of the built uh, form. And also, uh, of course, uh, in consequences to that, it was very interesting to work on the infill, not to the uh, smaller open space that you can, uh, uh, that you can find uh, inside that is a strong grid settlement that was defining uh, the two cities. So I had a kind of uh, tour worldwide uh, during this exercise. And uh, the, the, the second, uh, the, in the second one, that is also the last, I decided to uh, keep in a way the same structure. Uh, thematic lectures, in this case on architects. So I selected eight architects, contemporary one from uh, uh, Zumtor to Toyo Ito, uh, Tadao Ando, even uh, uh, further on uh, um, 
on Renzo Piano. So very, uh, I would say, even um, uh, well-known, even too much known uh, architects. But I asked the students to choose one project from uh, the architects that they were discussing in the class. There were no boundaries. And to uh, make a design interpretation on their methodologies. Uh, so at the end, the students choose one architecture from one architect, and they make a model. Uh, into a box that was a, a cube uh, and they make an interpretation of this building. So uh, this model at the end, this object was the final result of this uh, uh, assignment and we made an exhibition in the school. So I think you might uh, recognize some of the, uh, probably some of the original building that were uh, uh, taken uh, into, into the study the, uh, from, from the students. Uh, the, the, the only rules uh, was about uh, the basis of the, of the cube. Uh, then, of course, inside the cube, they could also uh, made uh, whatever interpretation uh, uh, they needed. And uh, uh, experimentation about the material, experimentation about uh, how to uh, recreate the feeling of the building uh, through the uh, through the space, or uh, in the case of that you can that you can see here, it was more uh, important uh, to make in evidence the the facade, you know, the structural uh, uh, composition of the facade, or in the case uh, of the of the pro of the cube that belongs to the idea of Tadao and of course the uh, structure of the box was the replication of the concrete uh, uh, facade with the, even the uh, uh, the understanding of the of the structural elements. So it was a kind of uh, journey throughout uh, uh, architecture and architects. And I, I, as you can see, these are not uh, uh, design uh, projects, but the, the students made a design uh, to, to create their interpretation. So they had to make, in a way, a project to read uh, these case studies, as uh, it was the name of the, of the course. And uh, uh, I asked them to also uh, make a short text to, with images to explain uh, uh, the process that, uh, that they have uh, uh, followed during, the, during this, uh, this path. You know, these courses, uh, the two courses that I was uh, running uh, at SEPT were all uh, uh, semestral courses, so they, of course they had a span that was very different from the, uh, from the one in Milan. They were more uh, shorter, faster and compressed. And uh, we, the, also the exhibition was part of a larger uh, set of uh, uh, exhibition that happened every semester at the end of the, uh, of the courses uh, in the university. They uh, host this beautiful exhibition with uh, all the courses that uh, show up uh, the assignment. So we were also part of this uh, exhibition. And this is, uh, I think it's the last image. It was one of the uh, classes that I was uh, uh, taken even for the, after the, the teaching because I was, uh, uh, I'm still before even, uh, uh, before the arrival of the COVID, I was uh, making this workshop uh, uh, together with them. Uh, and this is the final, uh, just to conclude, I think we, these are of course just a few notes, but uh, again, most of the courses are related to the discussion on tools, even the more theoretical one, let's say, so models, drawings, axonometry, but I also ask uh, students many times to discuss, so to have the ability to critically analyze the spaces, the building, before to design, and also to study project, to look at the references. And that's why in the, in the courses uh, in India, you had more freedom, I would say. And I push them to even make something very uh, probably difficult to be done in Milan. So rethink uh, one aspect of a building and make another project out of them or make a box that recall this, uh, this idea. And of course, most of the works uh, and the work in the studio, to me, it's a matter of uh, balancing the abstraction and the reality. So I, I probably think that I saw some, some, some of these aspects even in the uh, presentation of my colleague, but that was uh, in a way the, um, the idea of this journey. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, sorry, this is Dika speaking. <laughs> um, I thank a lot, Julia, Johan, and Matt for the really great presentations. It's been really inspiring for here, which is on a Friday evening. Um, it's really relaxing. But um, so I think maybe we're ready to start the question and answers. Um, if everyone can hear me. Okay, so. I think the first question will be from Yeni, and this is for Johan and Matt. How long did these projects take to complete? 
and afterwards maybe for both is what were the assessment criteria? Mm. Good uh, questions. So um, the projects that we showed you were second and third year and they're taught vertically. So the, the length of the project um, is exactly the same to the second and third years. The, I guess the building projects we were showing you the outcomes of um, are started in January. Um, uh, uh, so the academic year starts at, at September. They do a project up until Christmas, which is a pre-project, if you like, a smaller project, um, design project. Then there's a field trip in, um, in, in January, the start of January, and then they complete um, that project by um, uh, early May, so uh, five, five months, I guess. Um, and that's divided, I mean, split um, sort of two-thirds, one-third in terms of time um, over, the, over that period um, for design development up until um, European Easter. And then, um, and then there's a sort of a hiatus, a break in, in, the, in, in the teaching. And then they come back, as, as Johan said, um, I guess sort of four months, three and a half, four months into, into having designed that completed design. And the last, the last part of that term is then, or is, is, is ten, taken um, resolving or explaining the, the building through, through so, renders. So, and, and I guess next to that, so in terms of the assessment of the project, the um, what we show you is the combination of the design course. So that means that, you know, the, the stuff that they actually design the building, but, but in parallel with that, they have a technical study, which is a technical report about materiality and all these other stuff with a particular focus on the student's interests. And then they have a history and theory, like a thesis, I guess, on the side of that. So we, we're not really involved with that, but you're trying to kind of get all of those things to culminate. So your thesis is similar to the theme of your project and the technical, as you saw in Annabelle's project, directly affects the project, I think is the kind of case. But the, the assessment is like, it's RBA guided. So there are the kind of basics, everyone has to have a plan a section that is very detailed in, in, in its scale, like zoom ins in one to 20, uh, and, and, and then some 3D, 3D, no, 3D work. But, um, but essentially, it's very broad what the students do, right? There's no, there's, you don't have to have a 3D or have to have a, a, a it could be any, anything that's three-dimensional in that case, right? Yeah, I hope that answers the question a little bit. It's quite short and we only showed you the final bits, right? I guess, of, of the project, except for Annabelle's, yeah. Duh, sorry, silence. Sorry, Dika. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Julia, would you like to share uh, what would this is my materials for you? Yeah, the, the criteria was, uh, I think it's kind of different because I had um, uh, many exercises. So three exercises in one year. We started in uh, uh, late uh, end of September and we had uh, a break between uh, in January and February that uh, is uh, Christmas. Let's say it's a long holiday in Milan. So we have a first semester till uh, December and then we have the second semester from, let's say, uh, end of February till June. So I made an uh, intermediate evaluation uh, and I asked the students to uh, even keep track of their work. And what happened at the end is that the final project is the, uh, the longer one is in a way a recalling. You know? So I am uh, asked them to make the drawings, to combine them, to make the model, uh, and as far as possible to make a small exhibition in which maybe other colleagues come. So we don't have a system of, uh, uh, as I, I, I see from my colleagues, that is very interesting, you know, the, the way of showing up the work uh, in a collective way. We are too many, so it's impossible in Milan. So we have, uh, we, but we can usually we invite colleagues to join, uh, especially the final critics, you not know, to have an external glimpse. You, you see the students for one year. So my difficulties is sometimes to be objective, you know, in the grade. That's very complicated because you know them too much and you are of course engaged in the design uh, even if you, if you don't want it to become uh, you know, quite uh, difficult so sometimes external reviewers are invited to, to discuss the project. Uh, okay cool so the second the next question is it was addressed to Johanna Matt but yeah Julia feel free to jump in it to share your thoughts so this is from Rabani now, what kinds of thoughts, uh, what kinds of things do you look at or do to create, to curate students' um, design? You know, because you had said that you, you kind of feel like your role is a curator and editor of the work. And also like, um, how do you then also develop the projects to the full potential, especially maybe for students to feel they're behind? 
And maybe I might like kind of mash this with Danny's question, which is about maybe do you use like um, ways to make the students feel comfortable to develop their own approach and what kind of stimulation, you know, to encourage the students to find their best appropriate media? Yeah, so I, I would uh, answer that. Maybe you can, you, know, you can jump into the sort of second part of it. Um, outside of um, the design studio, um, the students are getting various other sort of skilling courses. They're getting skilling lessons and training in uh, computer software. Um, they're having access to um, workshops within the physical workshop for, for how to make things. Um, and then Johan and I supplement that with, with our own sort of um, uh, workshops. I, I said workshops, I, I guess sort of, um, yeah, sort of workshops at the start of the day. So we might, we might once or twice a term introduce the idea of kind of a method of model making or or um, we might do a little talk on uh, graphic representation so we will we will introduce um, through through representation um, other examples of, of, of how um, how that happens we also at the start of every academic year we invite two or three students um, from both second and third year to come back and talk about their work and to talk about the systems of development in the work so I think it can be quite daunting for a new student coming in and seeing um, the final output of a body of work like that. But actually, um, if you see the context within which it's developed, the, the, the whole portfolio, you actually see that this is um, small bites, you know, of a big thing that ultimately makes, makes up this body of work. And I think that, that reassures those students. So a mixture of, of definite skilling classes both within the studio and outside of the studio, but also creating a kind of culture where um, it's very open, um, so the students are physically in the same space working and producing stuff together, but it's also within a school where um, there isn't, the, the building that we are in now is, is not a great piece of architecture, but it's, it's fundamentally an open plan space where um, the old building used to be all the studios were separate closed rooms. Uh, you, there's no hiding, so, so we, you, you see everything around, right? You, um, we're all, uh, well I don't know about all of us, but I, I'm a magpie. I, I just I just steal things from all over the place where I see them, and, and you hopefully you process that in a good way, and you you make a nice nest out of it. There's a sort of real balance between being very influenced and look at stuff very carefully, but also somehow digest it and kind of interpret it in your own mind so that it's helpful. Because sometimes references can become so strong that the students essentially can't really get rid of them. So we're quite careful about what we show students. In some ways it has to come from them. Quite often we say, well, bring us something. And then if there's something that is really obvious, you go like, well, you know, try and look at this or, you know, but, but and, and, I, and I think that the references usually comes from uh, towards the end of the year. It is more building references, but in the beginning of the year, there can be many other things, right? References to landscapes, some bit of art, or, or like some technology that we're kind of really fascinated by, or a social construct more than actually architecture, which I think is quite interesting. But we, we, we really try and force students to look at and show us stuff that they're interested in before we give them too much, right? Like it's a, it's a real balance, isn't it? You might actually, you, you, you see this thing and you go like, either you see something that we gave them and you go like, okay, I've got to make something that's completely different because, you know, I, I can't just copy what they showed me. There's the kind of a, I get what Julia is saying. Like it, we, we're fortunate in the sense that the, that student group gets chopped into, you know, 15 stu students per unit, right? That, that you can have that conversation. I think if you have a, I think it's very much applied to, like Bartlett is like one year went from 15 students to 16 students and everyone was like, oh no, my God, this is the end of the school. <laughs> this is literally it. Like no one can teach like this. And, and I remember when we were teaching you, Deeker in Oxford, it was like 26 students. And it, you know, like it, there's a limit to how individual you can be in that context, right? So you, we, can, we can tailor projects very particularly to students because, we only, because there's more staff per year group, right? Basically in that way. So I, I sort of, like Julia, it's like, it's a different setup. When you've got 50, 55, it's like twice what we have in UD. That is a, that's a handful, man. <laughs> but, uh, that's a lot of students, isn't it? It also, I mean, just because I want, Julia, you obviously want to speak as well, but the, the I think the answer to that second part of your, the question, Dika, about the sort of parity and fairness across the board, it's very, it's, it's much easier to do that because there are 15 conversations in a day when we have tutorials and those, are, those can be very tailored um, and nuanced to the particular individual. And I think um, part of, part of us, our success as a studio is not always to uh, attract the, the strongest academic students, but the students that want to grow the most, right? But the, yeah. um, and we've been really blessed like that with having students who have grown. But there's, there's, 
um, you know, we give the same, and we're really strict about that. We, that's not the same in all teaching in the UK for sure, that we, we give the same amount of time to students, whether they um, are strong academically or strong, you know, um, and have a low, high levels of production as the ones that are less so, um, but it's a different set of conversations that are tailored for those. Sorry, Julia. I, I, uh, I, I think it's uh, that one of the of the structure of the way in which, uh, of course, yeah. you you uh, each of us and uh, organize the studio. It's the the key the key aspect, no? Because we have different uh, uh, configuration. As I said, we are we also have co teachers that are from other disciplines. No? So that's another uh, game, no? In which uh, sometimes you have a professor of representation, a professor of structure. So uh, the idea of the of the studio is also to uh, to train uh, this huge amount of students to have a multidisciplinary approach and sometimes it works and sometimes, sometimes uh, not so much so uh, that's another uh, another point and of course the number uh, uh, in, uh, to me makes uh, compulsory to have groups and when you have groups of students sometimes they also have to find their own balance you know it's not always uh, an easy combination and they also have their own uh, references their own ideas so the, the project at the end is a combination of uh, uh, the, the right uh, uh, the right uh, balance i'm also teaching in the international uh, uh, track in italy so not uh, not only italian students actually very few italian students so the uh, the freedom that i try to also so sometimes to give the students on their language, you know, as you might have seen on the on the project comes from the variety of approach that they have. You know? So it's uh, impossible in a way to and not right to confine them in only one uh, one school, let's say one direction. No? But I, I prefer to open up uh, the, the, their feelings no? because I, I take them when they are already in a bit of train you know, for the basic uh, uh, skills. At least I was and now I am in another store because I trained them at the beginning and that's another uh, Big, yeah. big question. Mm. Okay. Uh, so maybe we might talk about this idea of teaching and then especially because of the pandemic. I don't, Julia, have you also been working like online with your students? But um, so for, for both of uh, you guys, um, how has pandemic teaching kind of changed in how you see students have been learning and thinking and making? And then have you kind of picked up anything that influenced your new normal teaching? I, th I, th I, think, I think that, the, as we said before, I think one of the kind of nice things about the ballot is its openness to each studio and the fact that the students kind of walk down the staircase and they see a crit from a fifth year in their second year or you know, or, or the fact that we sit next to each other. And I, and I think that was the hardest thing for us to somehow implement digitally that, um, I need some curtain pulling. Um, it, digitally, it was like, a, it was hard to kind of find a platform in which students freely just hung out, you know, because I think part of success of a student, we always say to students, we see you, what, like 10% of your, you know, student time, we see you for 20 minutes or 30 minutes every week or something, which is already quite extraordinary for a university course, right? So they get more than most other people. But at the same time, it's like most of the time, they need to learn from each other and see each other's work. And, and, and especially the progression from second and to, to third year, or even, sorry, this, this, my, my office is very, uh, very sunny. <laughs> but it, but it, it's kind of like, I, I think that was tricky that the, the, they need to sort of, you know, talk about how annoying Matt and I are and, or, or like what, what they understood from this conversation and stuff like that, which, which didn't naturally happen. So that was a minus. But on the, on the positive note, we didn't set up briefs in one place. The briefs were all over the world, like according to where the students were, right? Because, you know, it's very international, so everyone were everywhere in the world. And it, it, that was quite incredible that we saw these projects that emerged from either places that people would like to go to, but had to sort of study online. All, all were very close to them. So we saw these much more, I, I don't know if it's individually, but locally attached projects. That was really lovely. And I think the second thing was maybe that um, the, the digital format forced everyone to sort of share things in a more immediate way. Like, you know, so it wasn't so elaborate in terms of hundred drawings. It was like, you show something on screen and we were able to sort of connect to people like we are now, right? In you know, we had quite a few people from Denmark, the States or whatever coming into a crit because 
you know, it would be weird to have a computer in a crit room normally, right? But actually here, you know, we had like film directors from America or whatever. It was, it was quite a lovely thing in some ways. It, it felt more connected than that way. So it's plus and minus, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah I think, and also um, we tailored, we obviously had one year where the half of the academic year was in person and half of it or was, uh, so 2019, 20, right? That was, that was a split year. Um, so we were just sort of trying to make sense of that, but we, we tailored last year, which we didn't see any of our students at all for the entire academic year, it was all online. Um, and we decided to, um, there are two modules, the pre-Christmas module and the post-Christmas module, and we decided to shuffle that together to make one project for the whole year, where, which meant that, um, that it sort of slowed the pace down rather than, to, rather than combine the whole building yeah. design project after Christmas. We basically set the time before Christmas is the research, the brief development for the project after Christmas, which I guess um, actually on reflection has turned out that I think we will adopt that irrespective from now on in our teaching anyway. So there's rather than two, two projects, a sort of a test project and then, a, and then a final project, there'll be one project in the first part of the year. It's not that there's not design in that first part, but it's, it's predominantly about research and about idea building um, and the foundations for that, which means that the, there's real continuity for, 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 the, for the students. Um, yeah. So weird, isn't it? Didn't see it. Some of our students may be AI, you have no idea. You know, I don't know. They're not real. Okay, anyway, sorry. Julia, yeah, sorry, Julia, you go. No, I, I very, very few comments because my, the, the image that I showed to you from, from the architectural design studio were actually made uh, in the online uh, part of the course because it was one year course and I did the first semester in presence and the second one online. Uh, and I, I, I think that at the end I, I am really satisfied from, from what the students did and I think it was unexpected and uh, surprising uh, the, the capacity of, uh, uh, as Matthew and you know, were saying, you know, show incomplete drawing, break some of the boundaries that you might have in presence because you are afraid to show uh, a sketch or you are afraid to show something that is not finished and I also felt that the students were um, were improving they were uh, they had a lot of questions so the interaction was was good of course they missed uh, many things and I guess it was more difficult for them in the theoretical courses in which you had the lecture you had to listen and that that's at the end it's very difficult the studio is also kind of uh, a funny room and no? also they had the possibility to interact with the, with their colleagues uh, even without being uh, in the same in the same class they miss the other you no know, the other things of the university as as were said before you no know? the idea to see uh, the colleagues the the older one the younger one so to be you no know, uh, in connection with uh, with the others but i think from the from what they did it was very interesting and it was for us in Italy, it was a kind of jumping in the in the new year of the technology. So I guess uh, my colleagues were never thought that we would be able to make the class in uh, in digital, and we did it. So I think uh, we we can keep some of the of the learning uh, uh, that we had on the online uh, in the future of the teaching. I mean, things like what we are doing right now, no, are incredible resources that we were not able uh, to do it. I mean, we were used, no, that were not. It was not a common uh, way of making things. So, so I think it, there are a good aspects for sure. I, I think what, one thing I'd just say is like when, when like the, I, I certainly find that with, with sort of the, we're from working from home quite a lot now, like it, there's a sort of maybe a slightly unhealthy balance between when you stop working and when you essentially live, right? Like, and, and it's like kind of I think when, when it then went slightly downhill for some students, it was it was kind of harder to get out of, right? Because you, you were sort of slightly trapped in this place, usually with their parents and stuff like that, right? Which is, you know, a sense that, you know, that's the best thing about universities and you get out and you kind of, you're away from your parents, you start your own life. And, and that was somehow not quite the same, right? And, and I think so, so in, incredible work and worth it, 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 ethics from, from our students, but at the same time also when it sort of started to crack, then it was hard to get out of, I think, for some students, which I really definitely, we all felt that, right? The pressure of doing everything inside one, one house, right? But yeah, or your parents being like, why are you doing that? It looks weird. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, why am I spending all this money why, on this? <laughs> why am I spending all this money? Yeah, exactly. Why are you spending all that money on yeah. this? Doing some weird drawing. Anyway.
Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, I really would. I really this whole studio culture for me. If I could speak as a ex student, um, I, oh, yeah. I mean Oxford Brooks was twenty four seven. They had to get security guards to pull students out of the building eventually. But um, yeah, I remember when I'm staying up late and. This whole studio ambience is really helpful for when you're stuck and then getting a sense like being inspired by other people. But I think one of uh, Julio's, Julia's um, photos is really striking, this whole sense of physical presence when everyone's making the same cube at the same scale. And then, but people are making different things when it's all in the same place, you can suddenly see scale, which is something that is lost when you're working by yourself or, you know, through online. And I think, um, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure students would suddenly realize like when they come back, how, yeah, this idea of scale models. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, then uh, we've started talking about context and I think this is kind of a great uh, continuation. So Cecilia had a question about context, which is um, how do you make students um, feel the city and you know, how, how do you help them with the interpretation of it? And then, also connecting with Unita's question, so then do you kind of uh, encourage a nature approach to the space of the city? You know, this we can't, as architects, we can't run away from the idea of sustainability and being ecologically minded, uh, mindful, sorry. Um, and then maybe kind of like a second part, which is what my thoughts on students are being in this unique position as, a, as their own client. You know, you kind of make your own program and your own brief and the issues that you want to address. So then what other methods of thinking do you help? Do you, have you found helpful for students uh, kind of approaching this big task? Julia, do you wanna, do you wanna start this time? Um, no, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, about the, the, first, uh, the first part, how to feel the city, um, that's very, uh, when, when, when I was, um, when we were in presence, of course, I am a big fan of uh, survey uh, visiting the city. I use even to make study trip with my students uh, many times because I feel that the, when you see things, you have a different, uh, you, you start to feel them. No? Uh, but of course, when, especially when I was uh, teaching in India, I had the other uh, problem, the other way around. So the other were more skilled on the context rather than me. So I had to uh, also, uh, I push the students to, to look at papers, uh, drawings, uh, uh, even uh, the, the, the timeline of the city. So there are many ways in which you can, you can have the feeling of the, of the place. So to me, the best one is to have the possibility to be uh, uh, around the site in which you are designing. So that's the, 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 one, uh, the one thing. And about the nature, I think, of course, now, uh, nowadays we have this uh, important uh, uh, challenge for, for our cities, especially, I mean, in the, in the studio that, that I'm, I'm taking, uh, I always uh, try to uh, discuss the students, the relationship between uh, how much we built and what is the, the relevance of the open space, you know, even before the pandemic, but uh, Milan has this big issue on the uh, needs, on necessity of open spaces, of green areas uh, that are not only related to the sustainability of of the building itself, but I think they are more related to the well-being uh, of us uh, that we have the possibility to experience the outside of our projects and not only uh, the inside. And, and uh, that was that is one of the questions that I usually uh, push the students to answer. No? So we are designing the building, but we are also designing what is around you know? and uh, how much we built uh, is also based on the on the necessity of the program. And in, in some parts of the uh, of the studio, I ask uh, students to really think about the program in the in the minuscule details. No? Because uh, sometimes I feel that they give uh, uh, they give for uh, for uh, granted uh, dimensions, uh, square meters, uh, like a machine. Also, professor said that they have to build uh, eighty one square meter. I did it, so that's perfect. And uh, maybe that is perfect in some of the you know, previous uh, and immediately exercise. But when they have to work in the city, I ask them to think about the size, especially, for example, the size of the apartment. You know? So now we are also facing situation in which uh, families, uh, people are living in a different ways. You know? uh, in Italy, we have a, a continuous and changing situation, but 
the, the, the size of the apartment could not be the standardized, you know, they have to be uh, actually carefully uh, thought. Um, and the last question was about the, the ownership, you know, the, 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 the idea of the owner uh, that, that you said, Dika, you know, uh, uh, like the clients, yeah. the clients, uh, yeah, uh, that, that usually I, um, it, when, the, when we are working in Milan, I ask the students to understand that also the client uh, is the city, you know, so we are always uh, discussing about the municipality issue, uh, what are, uh, what is planned for one of the area that we are studying, but sometimes I also ask them to imagine to be like the one who has to build, for example, this project and also the, the constructor, because some of the uh, projects that uh, sometimes we, we see from the students are extremely uh, fascinating, but they uh, sometimes they, they, uh, they have a gap you know, from, from, the, from the reality. You know? So uh, one of the questions when we are towards the end of the, of the design, and of course we are arriving to the, to the last uh, pieces, is to understand uh, what is uh, really, you know, the, the, the actual, uh, let's say, reality of the project. One of the questions they usually ask to students is, would you like to live in the apartment that you design? And most of the time the answer is no. <laughs> so, so, okay, so we have a problem. <laughs> sometimes, not most of the time, but sometimes it happens. Now there are these beautiful, large, incredibly large apartments, a lot of uh, empty space. Uh, and I think uh, also the, the, the fact that we can learn you know, from the even from the space in which we are living, something that is uh, difficult for, for the students sometimes to, to grasp. You know? The fact that, of course, we, have, we are staying in home, in apartment, we experience public spaces, public buildings, so we can learn the bad and the good things and try to apply you know, to, the, to the design. Okay, cool. I mean, uh, yeah, I think that sounds very... The, 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 yeah, that's definitely also along those lines. I think that we were kind of thinking. Like, so you, sh I, I guess, you, you kind of you experienced the field trip with us back in the days, and quite often the, the the student project will be attached to a place that none of us really know that well. You know, so so Matt and I usually kind of try and go places that we have kind. Of, occasionally, it's been like going back to New York a few times or something, but it's kind of you know you, you try and go to a place that you have little idea about, so that everyone's on the same page. You have to kind of discover it yourself somehow. And the students from before going, we asked them to kind of sort of from afar study an area that might fit a brief that they're interested in, attach themselves to an idea that uh, that interests them, a social construct, something that that is a you know New, New York time with the Trump building was an ex exemplar, right? Like they were, there was a high, there was a highly engaged political situation there. And actually, the the, la the, the years after we we kept coming back to America because 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 it was so ridiculous the, 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 the situation in the political world. So quite often the students were attached themselves to that. Um, so, so it comes from the place that we're in. And then the field trip with us is quite often, we, you know, we see the students, we walk around the city, we get an idea, but we leave them alone for quite a lot of the time. You probably, you'd remember that. We would we dip in for tutorials at the end of the day, but in order for students to really get under the skin of their particular sites, you, you, we can't spend the day walking around in a group. You'd have to spend days on site and valuable time within a field trip when you're away quite often gets used <laughs> for just seeing, looking at buildings, right? And it's fine, people would do that anyway, right? But we actually wanted people to just be on site for a while because you, you're gonna have enough information to, to take back to London and you can't just go back, right? You have to sort of absorb it. And I, and I guess the, the thing is that you're then creating something in a context that you are not in and the critics are usually not in. So you, you've got a certain amount amount of disbelief to kind of create something that that will fit in but I think it also ties in with this with sustainability the fact that we, we asked the question about what is you know what's the sustainable approach to this not necessarily always about materiality quite quite often it's about social sustainability like how does it fit in the city what are, what is the community that it involves and what's the future of the building it, you know lots of architecture students especially at that age are like thinking that the buildings will become this monument, right? But quite often you have to say, well, is it a catalyst for something else? Will it die? We have no control of this program of the building in the future. Is the sustainable approach to this building actually that it's adaptable in the future and quite easily taken apart? You know, what, what is it that you want to implement on site and how long do you see it for? You know, and I think those questions are really quite interesting for us in some ways. I mean, I think this, this idea, and that ties through to this idea of kind of uh, architectural authorship and, and that role that the kind of 
unre unreal worldly um, situation where the where the architect in our context is the client is is the brief maker and the brief responder and that's not something that in reality is we're faced with necessarily as architects we rarely get a client who says here's 10 million dollars um do what you like um uh, <laughs> it doesn't happen so um we haven't met one anyway yet but so i think um the way in which you, because I think there's a real danger in that in that in that environment, and we're 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 working a school where where students are encouraged to devise their own briefs in response to um, to to their to the thematic agenda. Is that we the way we do it is that we always root those projects in both, as Johan said, a real context, a physical context, a place, um, but also a kind of cultural economic context. So students. Um, have these kind of um, uh, obligations to both those two elements of of, of the, the sort of seeds to the brief of their architecture. So whilst there 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 is this kind of artistic ability to evolve the minutiae and the response to the brief, the community with which you're operating in our unit at least, and the site and the place in which you're building, those two are those two are known entities and they're facts. You know, they're not facts, but they're 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 actual. So the students are asked to identify actual communities of people they would be working with in the real, if this was in the real world. And I think that that forms a sort of an obligation to, to, um, to bring a, a degree of kind of realness to that. And that doesn't mean that the architecture needed to be any less adventurous. Um, and I think the other thing which is sort of, which is sort of, I guess, culturally within the unit is that we, that we, we spend quite a lot of time um, getting our students to do the research first of all and, and Johan that might be about spending you know a day actually just literally on your site seeing the minutiae of the patterns of behavior of a place which it also allows you the time to survey it in a, in a physical way but um, through I guess uh, uh, as much as you can from afar but through sort of exquisite research and thorough research you you get a knowledge base and then quite quite um, often quite disconcertingly for students we will um, tell them to just follow their intuition and intuition students when you say that they, they say oh well we don't know what we're doing we haven't we, we're not we've not got 20 years experience designing buildings but actually that intuition is not something you magically pull out of the air we say it comes from that research that knowledge base and actually if you give them the confidence to do that and that again that's where the curatorial role we, the right nudge here and there you know allowing and, and bringing out the strengths of where that intuition lies with the student actually allows you to develop and design a response that's appropriate um, to, to a site in a much more conventional sense. So you almost you become obligated to, to the site and the community rather than this sort of shifting brief. And it, it, Johan said this earlier on in the, in the session was that actually it's often the second year students who are unencumbered by the pressure of it being their final year who, who um, divine a brief and are really just throwing themselves into it and designing. And it's often the third years who are procrastinating and having that dilemma of the artificial dilemma of, of oh, what shall the brief be and how am I going to respond to that and, and find themselves in a kind of spiral of internal dialogue, which, you know, you have to, as a, I mean, our role is to sort of snap them out of that. And sometimes you can't snap them out of it. They're still talking about it sort of at Easter. <laughs> anyway, that's it. That's kind of it, isn't it? Yeah. But we, we have quite often thought about, because Matt and I did our final years at the bank. Yeah, I'm, I'm Danish. I came from Denmark, and Matt came. You had your education yeah. in Scotland, right? So, and we were in our degrees given a site and a brief, right? Yeah. And and sometimes we were like, should we do that? Should we, you know, like, yeah, like like you would in reality. This it would be like hell if if I had if you know I, in my practice had to come up with everything all the time. I'd hate that, right? It would be my that's my worst nightmare. But, my, my but, yeah. but there's also and the flip side of that. It is an amazing place where you can tailor a project to your own interests, right? It doesn't always happen like that, right, in reality. So, yeah, I think that's kind of, anyway, I don't know. Did Julius Penn look so far apart? Same thing, right? Didn't you have, yeah, yeah, there you go, like, same. It's like, is that the architect's tool? That's, that's, that's it, isn't it? Anyway. I think so, yes. <laughs> so let me pin and you're fine. Yeah. Sorry, DK. Oh, no, yeah, it's, these are really good points about this. Um, how do you help the student, you know, overcome being that getting that tourist gaze when they go to a new context? But at the same time, if they are locals in the local context, how do you help them not to overlook the simple things that other people might might find 
um, special. And I think that research and the analytical mind as an architect comes in, which leads us to the next question by Unita. Um, because, you know, as, as undergrad tutors, you're kind of shaping the architect's mind in the early infancy is like through this early education in first and second and third year. So then how do you kind of, um, so how do you balance, uh, how do you help them like grow the analytical mind? What are the kinds of things that you, you know, how do you help them find their voice and then their stance as an architect or balance that with their competencies? Um, sorry, we also only have like 10 minutes left. <laughs> Um, and maybe I could squeeze another question. It's just, uh, which is in this design education, what is the biggest difference you've seen and how uh, pedagogy has been uh, evolving? <laughs> Sorry, these uh, are like two that's different a, things. That's a big but... one for the last 10 minutes. Just lastly, what's, <laughs> how do you see education? You're like, what's up? Anyway, Judith, do you want to go? You, you, I'm oh, no, no, you, you, you go. Yeah, okay. yeah, please. please so I, I think. It, in in <laughs> in uh, in a nutshell, um, I mean, can you talk about the context within which we teach, um, and that being quite Johan, I'm just going to touch on. So Johan and I both were in different parts of the world, Scotland and Denmark for our undergrad, but we, I guess, a much more kind of Beaux Arts education where it was much more, um, I guess, um, uh, information fed um, uh, process of teaching, and um, and then physical and actual briefs given to us that we responded to. I think in both in retrospect, we both raged against the machines that within which we were working at the time as undergrads and, and felt those incredibly restrictive. But actually, I think in then being given both respectively time and space within the context of postgraduate at the Bartlett, where we were both years apart, but we were both um, studied, is that you realize the, the primer of your architectural education um, as, I mean, well, uh, Johan and I feel fundamentally that, that our degrees in the UK should be um, a good primer for building design. People should be able to leave third year in, in understanding the principles of building design, architecture building design. Architectural education could be many, many things, but we, we think that's quite important. And that's not, that's not universally accepted in, in the UK and certainly not in a school like the Bartlett. There will be units where students graduate not with the requisite skills to go and sort of understand the principles of building design. So I think the, the, the foundations of your, in the Bartlett, start with the first year um, um, being taught as a whole year, and it's an operation of scale. So just in, 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 in five steps, project one, students um, are asked straight away to reflect on a space that they already understand in their lives, often a personal domestic space in their home setting, they're asked to explore and unpack that, or it might be something as small as an everyday object, which they're asked to unpack. They're then That's a two week project. They're then given an eight week project where they're asked to work collectively to make a piece of space, to make an installation immediately. So to make a space and Fit respond and, to and, and physical and space. Building and it in a workshop kind and of build thing. That. Right? Yeah. And that's eight weeks. And then they're asked to reflect on that in an urban context and do an urban and piece of urban analysis, which takes them up to Christmas, which maybe three or four weeks which is sort of taking what they've learned about space making and apply it to city. They then go away to a, usually a foreign city and they're asked to look at a fragment of that city in minutiae. So it's this constant zooming in and out, but it's not, it's through a series of steps which then lead them into the building design post Christmas into, so the, in first year. And then that's, that's, that's taught individually to students. They're not in, they're, they're not in, they're given usually a brief and a place, but they're very open to interpret that. And, they're, and then they're really nurtured. So the teaching in first year from the tutors is, is much more handheld and much more nurturing and much more teaching rather than discussion. Um, these are the things that you need to learn. These are the things you need to think about and that we've touched on to today. And then in the rest of the, the, the second and third year, that's vertically organized, but with the knowledge that students in those second and third years are going to likely experience two very different ways of learning and thinking about space. So they, 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 space making and architecture, the production of architecture. You've seen one example of that, but you might find some units, and probably about half the units that are preoccupied in the way we are about building design, but half that aren't in a conventional sense, that they might be much more interested in the sort of, just the narrative idea of space making or filmic space make, making. And you could, you could you know, spend a year exploring things. The danger with that system, Maybe, and, and, and Julie, you can talk to that maybe, but the danger of that system is that you can graduate as a, an undergraduate from the Bartlett 
not really knowing that much about architecture as building design. You well, know? you yeah. you were sort of being forced to make a sense of like you're forced to make a, a set of plans and sections and yeah. spaces, right? But essentially, you're kind of like in that question Julia was saying: Does anyone actually want to be there, right? And you're like, I'm not. I mean, that's not. A, it's kind of a critique because I think they think the same of us that we're probably yeah. just really dull and boring, right? So yeah. it's kind of. I think it's like you know, grass always greener, right? But but essentially, I, I think the the structure of the brief, which I, I guess Julia showed very clearly, we didn't, sorry. That's because it's top secret, we cannot tell you. No, but it, it, like the structure of the brief guides the students through those stages, right? From being, um, you know, individual, like usually our structure is like, you know, quick startup project, it doesn't need to be very architectural, just tell us something about you that's exciting so we get to know you. Fit, think about site, analyze site, think about program, analyze program, think about building. So, so it's like, you know, and, and then represent the building, spend a lot of time almost like making an autopsy of your building to kind of really digest it. So it's kind of, that's the way you can get that product is through those sort of stages. But then the media that they're using within is very individual. I mean, quite often there's a time for a plan, right? Or quite often there's a time for a section and stuff like that, right? Which is also following the other programs, like the technical program. They'll have to have that in order to answer some of their questions. But so that there are natural stages where this happens. But I guess we quite often have to, we are the ones who have to say, well, do a model then or do a drawing then or whatever, whatever we think is the right thing to kind of just take it that step further, right? But what that model is can be very many things, right? From being quite abstract to being well, incredibly, you know, direct, I, I guess, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, I don't know about that. And then the, the idea about where um, education is going, we'll, we'll leave to Julia. Uh, <laughs> just a small oh, question. Yeah, yeah. Small question. No, I, I, before the, where the education is going, I just take one, uh, <laughs> one part of the, of the last question, because, for example, I think in Milan we have the opposite problem, no? Because the, the rigidity kind of the system doesn't uh, give to the students a lot of uh, skills I would say but I think the flexibility and the ability also to do the verticality that it's very interesting to me it's an approach that I think it's quite uh, could be the future not to me rather than uh, be fixed in the in your own class uh, it's a kind of it become a comfort zone so in a way the idea to mix uh, it's uh, it's very interesting and I also think that uh, we have uh, in Milan this annual uh, student Studio that are on one side very very challenging for the students so you can do a lot with them but on the other side uh, they, they they are very long and they are not anymore uh, related to our time no so we we never do projects that are uh, I mean they, we, we do we do in the sense that if you have to build it of course it, it, it takes a lot of time but when you are in a phase of making the ideas and making the project it's much way faster so the students uh, in the third year in Milan they have to to jump, you know, they have to move very fast and they don't know how to do it because they are trained to uh, go in this longer studio and that I think is, uh, is a, a problem, one of the issues that you know, we, are, we are discussing and we have to face. Of course we have different numbers and that's, uh, that's another uh, issue but I think uh, there are options also to for example, consider some uh, uh, fundamental courses with uh, basic exercises that could uh, train the students at the beginning, and then you can do semester studio in a, in a much uh, uh, faster way. And for the future of the education, I mean, I don't know. It is very, it's very hard. I, I think that, the, but I would say that the future, we, we already did a very strong jump in the future, I would say, because uh, uh, in many, many ways, this, you know, this very difficult situation in which we were all uh, inside was a kind of uh, training you know, to break boundaries and in a way to, to be able to think about the future. But of course, especially in architecture, I think that, the education uh, is, uh, in, in, at least in Italy, we have a very detached problem about what we do in the university as even academician and uh, what happens outside as architects. So we have this problem, uh, the, the division uh, between the people that are teaching in university and people that are architects uh, is a boundary that is uh, becoming uh, stronger. While I think it's very, it's ne necessary to, to be on, on site, you know, as architect and when you, when you are teaching, you know, so one of the, one of the questions that you have in Italy is how to change our system in a very larger scale, you know, so 
uh, who is gonna teach and why and what are the, the challenging you know, when, you, when you arrive to teach in the university. But that's also related to a very complex uh, system of career and so on that is not the time to open, but it's a, it's a question in our uh, pedagogy way of organizing the school and the university. I, I, um, to add to, to that, but in a kind of parallel, this may be, a, well, I think it's globally applicable, but um, the challenge that UK education is, is about to wrestle with is um, effectively a liberal design education, but within the kind of constraints of, of the climate emergency. And the RBA has already a, a identified this, that, that actually, if we are going to deal with the climate emergency, uh, architects are part of that solution, um, but they also need to be trained and taught and empowered to, um, to, to understand how they can do that. And in a liberal education environment like the UK, where students sort of can do what they like and they can extend and bend the curriculum, they're not taught so much. Um, more of their time, if, if, the, if architects are going to be you know, partly responsible for, for the built environment that, that is more sustainable, that, that meets the climate emergency kind of constraints, then we are going to have to teach a lot more about making more sustainable cities and sustainable environments. And um, so more taught education in the UK, at least, um, if, if we want to achieve that. And that, that uh, will take away from the, the time that's given to students to explore and express themselves purely from a creative point of view. And that will be a tension. That is a tension that's emerging because students rightly are saying that, that they want to learn about how they're going to solve that. Um, but within a fixed time and a fixed curriculum, they will have to limit their exposure and time to just explore things creatively. Which is like the, the new course that we're teaching now, is essentially a parallel course being tested at the Bartlett, but, but at, at the same time it's being built up year by year with different groups. And it suggests a different structure where instead of just being in the school, you, you start at the school in the first two, three years, but the, the, your third year is essentially theoretical. So you, you don't have to design as much. You are engaging in essentially in the thesis of your project and in the, you know, say environmental questions and stuff. And then you're followed by a year back in university and then you're followed by a year in practice. So it's a completely different kind of way of seeing this kind of thing where actually you maybe have more time to, to work things out theoretically if you, if you don't try and do that in parallel with design. It's going to be an interesting thing. I don't know if it works. I mean, it's certainly not because we're Ask us back in a couple of years. And we'll yeah, ask us. Be <laughs> See how much we messed it up. Anyway, cool. Um, I, there, was some, there was a question out there, which I thought was quite nice, actually. I don't know. Sorry, Dika, I'm not going to take over your job. But it said <laughs> something about whether we all teach together in pairs. And I think, actually... I can't stand uh, him. It's just like, yeah. it's just like uh, you know, it's just good money. Well, great money. Well, That's why I do it. No, no, no. <laughs> Actually, we still have another two question, but we were thinking, I mean, actually, uh, I, just, I, just, I, had yeah, a, I think that we need to whether you still have time to answer these two questions. Just this one is about the tutor things. The second one is about the cube. There is one person okay. asking really about the cube. Why cube? Probably, do you, do you have time to just to answer that question? Is yeah, that yeah, okay? yeah, it's fine. Okay, so let's start with Julia. Yes, I, I was reading the question and I was almost writing, replying to, to David. But why, why Cube? It, it, uh, it's a good question. Why Cube? Because when I started in, the, in these uh, uh, courses, I, I thought that we, we, I, I had to give to students some rules, some rules to, to start and also to experiment around the simple shape. So that's why I was... Uh, uh, starting with the idea of the cubes and then uh, the cubes become with different dimension because of course the first exercise uh, it's an object in a way so it's not um, uh, an architecture but it could be an architecture and the second one uh, the idea of the combination of the cube is to uh, image how adding uh, spaces you can you can combine uh, uh, a house but it's a very it's an exercise that comes, as I said, from, from the work of Francesco Venezia in UAV. He was doing a lot of this uh, cube uh, problem. Of course, there are many IDUC as well. So it's, uh, a, it's a never ending story, Eisenman with the, with the 10 houses. So I start uh, from this basic uh, shape and uh, to, to push the students to understand it from something very simple. It seems very simple at the beginning. You can have a complexity that never ends. And also that's the, the idea of the cube.
Uh, Julia, could you help uh, type the name of the architecture you are referring to about that? Ah, yes, sure. I can type it, it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So people, I mean, the audience could also study that if they want. Okay. Let's move to these tutor things. Is it always in a, in a pair? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think it's, 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 it seems to be, and I think actually that is that is a, a successful thing at the pilot. So each, you know, as we said, we, I guess we're privileged to have um, a year group of about 100 to 120 students. And then that's broken up into these like, say, 15 to 17 students per unit. And each unit have got two tutors assigned to it. And, and like those, those assignments, like Matt and I started, started teaching kids together a while back but sort of found each other and 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 and, and I guess you've been teaching a little bit longer than I have but um and and um and you make up those pairs like whoever you want to sort of teach with if if the butler agrees <laughs> and then um I mean in this case we got sort of brought back into the butler we tried to escape didn't work uh, and we got brought back in and then I guess it is actually really nice because on a, on a day, quite often a unit will take, okay, uh, one tutor takes one group of students and then the other takes the other, and then you split the day up, right? But Matt and I always, we, we much prefer to have shorter tutorials, but us teaching together, because I think it's just two brains. Matt and I, we, you know, we have the same, uh, like ambition and, and principles, but we, we're very different as well, right? Yeah. I taught for 10 years on my own in first year and the tutorials, I, I, I openly admit, I reckon about 30% of what I said wasn't useful when I was teaching on my own in a day. About 30% wasn't particularly useful. It was um, just too much, right? Where when you teach in pairs, we're like wrestlers, tag wrestlers, you know, we come in and one person's thinking and one person's talking, one person's thinking and you get, I'm pretty sure you get like 95% good, useful thought. And useful, useful conversation what? because when the other person's thinking and responding to a, a student showing, the other person's developing a kind of critique or a construction of an argument or a conversation or something they want to bring to the table. So, uh, and there's there's no right way, but for Johan and I, that that is certainly the way that we get the most. Map. We also um, we also bounce off one another. We yeah. we draw, um, and that's one that's been the biggest loss for us. I mean, we've been drawing on iPads on Miro, on, on Miro, but. Um, we we talk with our students. We talk. As, one of us is usually talking, and one of us is is oh, drawing. Like a so, year worth of tutorials. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's like that's a, that's a, that's a, a sort of a, that's last year's tutorials notes that were not online. So when we when we're talking, you know, you get like literally one of us is drawing while one of us is talking, right, about an idea, and that's that's just go. Doo -doo 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 -doo, that's. And so I think you get you get 150 percent for no not 150 250 percent for your your money twice yeah. is it twice more than twice <laughs> you try to sell it Matt. i don't know what uh, yeah he's also a really nice guy Aww. and we like i think that's the other thing we we uh, look i've got a um uh I, I i've got so much respect for full-time academics but my brain is i like I, i've i've had glimpses into academic full-time academia and we, we're like kind of a bit like ferrets with brains are scattered like this I find it really hard to, to work within the constraints full time of academia, and so we, when we go to teach, it's our, it's our, and it's not that we don't take it seriously, but it's our fun. It's it's our least stressful day of the week. Yeah, we're not we're, we're not trying to solve some sort of problem on site or kind of getting sued. We yeah. just we just basically you know like having fun with students, right? Talking about and fantastic. By fun, I don't mean that we're taking no, it not nice. seriously, yeah. but it's but it's it's enjoyable conversations about yeah. making space, the production of space. That's lovely. It's a privilege. The energy in the studio is is important, and I think it, it definitely it definitely is is kind of it works because yeah. of the pairs in some ways, right? Yeah. Sorry, long long answer. Sorry, it's probably really late where you are. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, well I, I, I don't see any ways you can answer that kind of question in a short way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, anyway, well, time is up. But I think for me personally, it has been uh, two hours of very enjoyable conversation that we are uh, and I'm pretty sure all the people, my colleagues uh, who are attending this session, uh, they are there for them to rethink and reflect on their teaching 
in everyday life. So I'm uh, I'm really pleased and I thank you so much for your time to be here with us. Uh, and uh, I I I uh, I we really hope I mean I hope we can discuss and we can have this connection again and and then we can have more sharing about the studio, uh, the studio in the future. And so yeah. Thank you so much for your time and for all the my colleagues, my friends who are also attending this session. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, for the next session of the encounter, we, we are going to have another presentation and sharing on the October 8th. Uh, so please join us later. So thank you so much and good afternoon uh, thank on, you. over there. Uh, and good night. Uh, thank you. Bye.